Welcome to the Learning to Die podcast. I'm Ian Dunican. And I'm Kieran O'Regan. How do I live when I know I must die? We explore areas of philosophy, psychology, martial arts, culture, existential risk, history, society, religion, science, and anything else that seems of interest and relevance to answering that question. We can only hope that some of what we learn might be of benefit to you too. Namaste, sapiens. Gia Smara Gwechakara, Kehi Wilter, Paul Jaroch, the Learning to Die podcast. Happy out, good to be here. There you go, we are joined today by the, the man himself, Johnny Dillon. He is, he is the myth, he is the legend, he is the folklore. <laughs> He is the man that coordinates all Irish things related to that subject. Johnny Dillon, how are you? I'm happy out. I'm um, yeah, I'm delighted. Thanks. I'm sitting Great, here in the car in case in case it's uh, in Cavan, in case you can hear just tractors and stuff screaming down the road behind me. But yeah, I'm this all is, good. This is actually a, a very authentic production here today. We've we've actually have Johnny in a limo in Cavan to get the authentic <laughs> Irish sounds in the background. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I just, I just want to give a quick intro here because um, before we delve into our, our subject today, which is on folklore and mythology, I came across Johnny's podcast, which is called in Irish. Johnny, what is the name of your podcast? Blurini Beledish. Um, should have thought about giving it a more pronounceable, findable name, but Blurini Beledish. So Blurini means uh, little fragments and Beledish is folklore. So folklore fragments is the English yeah. and Blurini Beledish is the Irish language version, yeah. I came across that podcast on Spotify a number of months ago, and I, um, I think what happened was somebody, Kieran actually sent me the uh, link to the Almanac of Ireland by Manchin, Mancon Mangan, whatever his name is, who lives down in Westmead. Yeah. I listened to that, and then I'm not sure how I got directed onto the Folklore Fragments one, where I was just searching similar ones or just like an algorithm that would suggest it. And I started listening to it. And it was absolutely brilliant. But I had no idea that this folklore department existed in University College Dublin, the UCD. Yeah. And so I listened to lots of episodes and I, I really felt, felt this real sense of connection with my own folklore and, and mythology of Ireland being out there for nearly 20 years. And I, I, it got me quite emotional. And I actually reached out to Johnny and myself and Johnny had a good chat a few months ago. And we've been keeping in contact um, since talking about a number of different things. And uh, hence why Johnny's here today, because this is such an interesting project that sorry an interesting job that johnny has interesting podcast but i also find as well i think that m many people around the world will be fascinated in the rich uh folklore and mythology that we have in ireland so that's why that's why i had johnny on so um kind of a weird and wonderful path it's not that we knew each other in ireland or grew up together and like that it's just kind of this weird tangent that happened and hence why johnny's on today so did I cover that right, Johnny? Was that, or did I tell any lies? Yeah, yeah, bang on, bang on. And it's, it was lovely, it was lovely to get that, the note as well, because even like we decided, I decided, I don't know how many years ago, maybe four years ago now to start with the podcast. So like you're saying, I work in, in the National Folklore Collection in University College Dublin, and that's kind of the, the successor body to what was a government commission that was set up in the 30s to document all aspects of Irish folk life, folklore, traditions, customs, beliefs, trades, all aspects of human life. <clears throat> unofficial expressions of, of kind of traditional culture basically but we're sitting on a treasure trove of stuff and just, so there's a sound archive there's thousands of manuscripts there's um about twelve thousand hours of audio we've over eighty thousand photographs it's a huge trove of material there so we started putting these kind of episodes out but it's it's can be quite a kind of one-sided thing in a way where you're you're doing research you're putting the episodes out yeah, and they yeah. go out into the ether and you don't really know that the life that they have yeah. in a way and then every now and then you'll hear back from people and the the influences they've had on people or the things that people have learned or it's shown them is amazing like i find it overwhelming when i when i hear that sort of stuff so it's really positive just a kind of a reminder of why why we do what we do i suppose so yeah delighted oh for sure yeah it was absolutely brilliant and then from that i've gone on like to listen to lots of eddie lenahan stories of eddie's i yeah, yeah. in contact with eddie eddie sent me a bunch of his books about them directly from him and that was good as well because Eddie gave me, you know, a current status of what was happening in Ireland economically and politically as well, even though I didn't ask. Yeah, he would. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And even, uh, I was like, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. so yeah. So so Johnny, this is this is a kind of an interesting subject. So um how how did you get into it? Like were you sitting at school chewing your pencil, looking out the window, going, someday I'm gonna be 
uh, you know, a folklorist uh, in Dublin. Is that what you thought? Uh, I was definitely sitting and still looking out my window and then it kind of stopped <laughs> after that. I, I wasn't uh, so diligent, but um, I think I always had an interest in, what would I say, in, in the ancient world. Like I remember as a kid, I was kind of obsessed by ancient civilizations and stuff like this. So I always had an interest in old things. And then definitely from my mother's family, my maternal grandmother, my mama, she would have she would have had a huge um, interest in Irish folklore, mythology, archaeology, the Irish language, early Irish literature, poetry, all that sort of stuff. So my mum's family were very kind of Gaelgory. Um, my father's family were quite kind of literary sorts, where they're all kind of soldiers and writers, basically, in that family. But, but my mum's family would have had that in interest in the Irish language. So it was always kind of in the background. I went to Irish language schools as well. But again, it wasn't something that I that I took huge interest in really until I got a bit older. So I studied, um, did a degree in UCD, did philosophy in English because I didn't know what the hell else to be doing with myself. <laughs> and um, towards the end of that course, I began to get interested in in Irish language, kind of balladry and songs, traditional songs, basically, in Irish and in English. And then at the same time, I kind of realized, apart from just the songs, like apart from the, the songs, and all that kind of, you know, those interesting kind of old ballads. There was also this weird world behind that of people collecting these songs. I remember getting books of the child ballads. And this guy, this scholar child who was kind of wandering around uh, England and Scotland. And he was kind of collecting. I, I just imagined this kind of, you know, strange adventure of this guy collecting these these old songs from manuscripts and old books. And, and so I began to realize that there was there was also this practice behind the, the items, the cultural items themselves, there was a practice of like collecting and codifying and kind of, and, and yeah, gathering all these different versions. <clears throat> so that became something that was of interest to me. Uh, and then around the same time, I started, I developed, an, uh, redeveloped a proper interest in the Irish language. Again, something I was surrounded by since I was little, but didn't really pay too much attention to it. And I was working in an Irish language bookshop in Bray called Cooper Fuckle. It's long gone now. Um, and Dahi O'Hogan, yeah. yeah, yeah. And Dahi O'Hogan, Professor Dahi O'Hogan, um, a total legend. He used to come in, he lived in Bray, and he was a friend of my grandparents'. Uh, and he used to come into that shop and he would buy books regularly. I mean, he was a published author himself and poet, and he was also a professor of folklore uh, at the Department of Folklore in UCD. Um, and he was the one then who, who kind of basically introduced me. He was like, you know that there is this place, like you're interested in this stuff. There is there is a kind of uh, Mount Olympus like Mecca for exactly this in UCD. So at the end of my degree in philosophy and all this, I went to into to visit the department and one of the professors there, Patricia Lysa, she took me in, showed me around and from, from the minute I walked through the doors, I was just like, this is where I need to be. Basically just became obsessed with the place really. And um, yeah, it's just like just walking through a door into another world, let alone its own history, but all, all of the holdings, all of the material, all the collections that are there, all collected from ordinary men and women all over Ireland. So it's, it's made of ordinary people's, our mothers and fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers' voices, basically. Um, so once you get into it and it starts to kind of, you start to peer in any direction, it's just this mix of something that's both very familiar and also kind of utterly fantastic and strange. So I just fell in love with it yeah, yeah. very quickly and um, kind of been stuck there ever since. Yeah, just, it's, it's, it never ends, just keeps unfolding, it keeps opening out. So now I suppose, apart from the day-to-day -day work in the NFC, one of the things that I'm quite passionate about is trying to, trying to drag this stuff out into the contemporary world as much as possible, because I think um, it has a lot of benefit to offer people in an age of great confusion, to put it mildly, I would say. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of yeah, very beneficial material in there overall. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's so rich. Yeah, it's it's so good. Uh, let me let me ask you this, Johnny. When you, when you're in there and you're walking around those archives and you're looking at physical copies or even digital or you're listening to things, do you ever get like emotional? Do you feel like you're tapping into like a to use Carl Jung's language, like a collective consciousness, like a, an Irish collective consciousness? Do you feel like you're because you've played stuff back from like, you know, 30s and 40s and there's accounts there from, you know, when Ireland was part of the British Empire. Do you feel this kind of like you're traveling back in time and it's 
getting a feeling of what's going on. The, the, it's kind of yeah, a yeah, you're really, no, it's not. It's, it's a perfect question. I, I, I feel that all the time. I do get very emotional about it. Yeah, like, and I mean, again, like obviously in your day-to-day -day work, if you're working with collections or curating things or whatever, there's a practicality around it. You know, you're not, you're not kind of wandering the halls in a misty-eyed kind of misty-eyed wreck, you know, <laughs> sobbing up and down the halls. But like um, that being said, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But that being said, like, there are many, many countless times where um, it's either a photograph of an elderly man or an elderly woman or an account or it's even just this kind of layer on layer of these these voices that, that it kind of, it forms a sort of, it's like working in a tabernacle, basically, is the way that I put it. You know, it's a holy place. It feels like a holy place in my mind. It doesn't feel like, um, I don't have this objective, rational uh, kind of indifference towards these collections. I absolutely love them. And I would also feel like they need to be, I don't know, defended or what's represented yeah, in them yeah. needs to be kind of cared for or looked after or not belittled and derided and kind of looked down on or mocked or whatever. Not that people do necessarily yeah. either, but it's a very strong emotional needs to be respected. It's a question of respect and it's a question of self-respect then as well, you know, in, in that if we're having respect for our, our our ancestors and, and, and the, those generations who came before us, um, you know, respecting them is about respecting ourselves as well. Like, and so, yeah, there's definitely a lot about self-respect and love basically at the, at the mm -hmm. end of the day, really like, um, so yeah, I feel very emotionally attached to the material there. Um, you can feel the presence of the past in the present, <laughs> if yeah. that makes sense yeah. with you there. Um, how it, how the echoes of the past kind of, uh, are still with us in the present, how they orient us, how they guide us. Um, so, so yeah, in short, there is a, a, a sense of connecting into a collective sense, a collective memory, collective sense of identity, communal memory, communal being, um, which comes naturally enough, I suppose, through, through when, you, when you begin to kind of, to explore these types of collections and folklore collections in general. Within that though, as well, like there's also, you know, there are really interesting individual expressions of individual lives or individual perspectives on tradition or on life as well. So it kind of both goes both ways. Like tradition, so Tahi Hogan <clears throat> mentioned a while ago, used to say that tradition is the, uh, it's, it's where, where the individual finds expression in the communal. He used to say it was the, it was the wisdom of the many expressed by the wit of the few. So the, the community nice. and memory and identity has a, yeah. has a, yeah, has has a community and memory has a part of it, but so does the individual has a, isn't just totally subsumed and absorbed into that either. The individual has a kind of um, a part in that as well. So I'm not sure if that kind of makes sense as an answer, but overall, yes, I would feel I feel a very strong emotional affinity and connection to those collections and the people, the people represented in them. Yeah. Kieran's busy there making about five hundred questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can always tell when Kieran's in question right and what down like that <laughs> jump in there Kieran and ask a question smoke coming off the page <laughs> he's a man yeah. he's... if I could, if I could it... be half as good as Kieran I'd be, be alright <laughs> <laughs> no I, I the, the first one is, is actually I suppose something I wanted to ask about that Ian just mentioned it a second ago was young and just mention it. I wonder how, how you have much familiarity with Young or Joseph Campbell after it and their kind of framing of these archetypal stories and archetypal characters. And if you had any, if you had any familiar with that, you might not. Then, is do you do you, do you find that any any way useful in viewing the Irish, the your favorite Irish myths or Irish mythology at large? Some of the what you see as kind of core stories or like foundational stories. Or if you, I don't know if, if, if that's something that you're familiar with, but it's something that just fascinates me yeah. as a concept. Yeah, it is. The fact that there are these archetypal patterns. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do, I do, I do like Young, certainly. I, I certainly wouldn't say that I'm like um, kind of any expert on his, <coughs> on his theories or writings or anything. But I love um, Man and His Symbols in particular. I love that one. But some of his later stuff, I haven't gotten through at all. So it, it'd be smatterings of surface level young yeah. really i think i would have kind of yeah. i would have gone through um as but i do love his writing and i suppose yeah yeah yeah, yeah. but um but as far as like uh, as far as <coughs> excuse me 
the application then a kind of ar archetypal presence is like, yeah, I suppose when you start to move into, say, the, the one of the realms of folk tradition that really interests me, and where maybe there's some connection to what you're describing or what you're what you're getting at, would be um, the idea of the other world, or specifically, I suppose, with regards fairy lore, which again, a lot of people nowadays would maybe have a very particular view of kind of twinkly twee fairies and it's all very genteel or something like that but in tradition it's it's represented in quite a different way that's the idea of the other world that's not um a kind of heavenly realm to which you go and never come back the other world is kind of sewn into the everyday world and there's constant bleed back and forth um and interruptions of the fantastic into the mundane and stuff like this where very strange things happen and you meet strange people or you go off to um uh, yeah, other world kind of realms have some weird adventure and come back, or sometimes people don't come back, or they're killed or maimed or whatever. It can be quite dark. It can be quite uh, pleasant as well. There's a whole imaginative and fantastic kind of landscape there, but it's the Irish just like fit to foot. I can't think of the English equivalent. It's it's just kind of very neatly sewn and stitched into our everyday, uh, um, the everyday kind of world of common experience, basically. So. Idea, traditional ideas in Irish about the other world are something that would link into maybe um, uh, Jung's idea of a collective unconscious as well. Mm -hmm. But I'd be reluctant to wade too far down that road because I just I would wind up talking shite in, in like no time flat. Basically, Johnny, this, this podcast yeah. should be called Talking Shite anyway. So that was actually oh, one savage. Of the, okay, was, all right, well, let's that, go. That, that, yeah, was, that, was one, that, was, that was one of the things getting banded around <laughs> with the title actually originally was Talking Shite. So, <laughs> okay, you're okay. not too far off. But on that, grand, point, grand. On, on that, here, here's something we should pull on because people will think about theories and they'll think about, you know, the Dar the things that, that well, not Darby O'Gill, but we'll come actually, I want to come back to Darby O'Gill later on. If, Do, because that was through the Folklore Commission that's, that that's that's was put I together. Actually, let's, let, let me yeah, ask you crazy. about that. So Darby O'Gill was made in 56? 50 something, I can't remember exactly, yeah. Maybe, maybe around mid-50s. And it was Sean Connery's probably <laughs> big breakout role before he became James Bond. He, he played this kind of, you know, local guy that was looking for a wife and there was this whole story intertwined with it and then there was this old guy Darby O'Gill who basically uh, befriended a leprechaun um, and uh, this whole host of things happened. It's a children's movie I watched it again as an adult and my wife said to me who's Australian how's that a kids movie? That scared the shit out of me and it is, it's a very it has that light and dark intertwined like you're saying and I often think about listening to folklore now, it's a bit like yin and yang the black and the white going back and forth and seeping into each other like in Taoism but is it true that what was a Walt Disney came to the folklore department before he met Dario Gill to research it? Is that true? Yeah, yeah. He he came. <coughs> so he, excuse me. He came and visited, and uh, and he visited the, the the staff of the folklore commission. Yeah, who took him around and tried as best they could to convince him uh, to to make a film. I think based on either you know the epic cycles stuff to do with Cúchulainn and the Thorn or fairy lore, the other world, and a kind of maybe slightly darker, more more genuine reflection of the tradition. But um, yeah, he went away and made Darby O'Gill and the little people and leprechauns and stuff like this. So I guess he had his own set view on what he wanted to do. And Hollywood always does, I suppose. But uh, but yeah, th we have files there, correspondence back and forth and photographs of Disney and Delargy. Um, and so Delargy was very much trying to, <laughs> to large, I suppose we're trying to evangelize in many ways for the role of tradition in Irish life full stop like he was he was really um a kind of a really central pivotal character a genius really who who managed to galvanize and organize around him a very brilliant team of folklore collectors um of interested kind of parties of school teachers of government departments able to get funding just get the one of these just get the job done type of mm. people basically get it up get it running make it happen um, and very, very charismatic in his writing. Lots of kind of dramatic, I suppose, hyperbole, which I, I love of the way he, he writes and describes things. But there was an air when they were recording, you know, when the Folklore Commission was set up, there was an air that there was, an, there was a feeling in the air, excuse me, that the old ways of life were in danger of disappearing and sliding into a state of anachronistic decline. The Irish language areas and the different parts of the Gaeltachts around the country were kind of disappearing. And an elderly generation who are basically this repository of life, lore and information were all going to shuffle off their mortal coils and there would be no record of the knowledge that they held because actually this is something I should have said at the start probably. When we're thinking of folklore, folklore is essentially the characteristics it, dis it displays. Like it, it is by, by essence informal, uh, so unofficial. Mm. It's traditional. 
it's communal it's often oral as opposed to being written down um and so that that kind of informality traditional communality uh, orality and then it often displays variability of form and stability of form so you have different variations of the types of narratives or types of crafts that vary from place to place but when you look at them over a wide geographic spread or or, or over time you see a stable kind of form overall and um, so the idea was that a lot of these elderly people had this this repositories of, of knowledge basically physical knowledge around making crafts and recipes and and um, um, you know house building and different techniques whatever but also more abstract stuff so huge multi-episodic folk tales that were 30,000 words long like we have a story Ochar Makri and Aaron collected from a guy in Galway it's around 30,000 words long but he I don't think he could read or write he, he, he wouldn't have heard, read that in a book that was all passed on as part of an, an oral wow. tradition and then recited by these these people, kind of scale of storytellers who could really, um, who in many cases, yeah, were, were totally illiterate, but who could, had this faculty of extremely uh, pronounced and skillful memory. And then they would recite these stories as entertainment. Uh, then you had local lore, historical lore, shanachas, so place names, local stories around fairies, ghosts, um, calendar customs, social folk custom, what do we do when a child is born? What do we do when a loved one dies? There's a whole landscape of cultural knowledge and information about the land, about the people in the land, people's relation to the land, um, growing up in a place, the seasons, the, the calendar, the, the yearly cycle of time and all the festivals, holy days, um, and then observances within that, and then the human life cycle. So there's a whole kind of cosmos of experience and information there. And so to go back to the commission, and they wanted to collect all that because the idea was that none, none of this material it can be found in a library. None of this is written in books. It's all unofficial. It's all unwritten. It's all informal. So we need to go out. The, the way that you gather that is through fieldwork, the fieldwork process, basically. So if we are the Folklore Commission, you would be employed as folklore collectors. You'd be trained. You'd work in your local area and you'd interview people about different aspects of their lives using questions and prompts that were drawn up by the commission, yeah, yeah. basically. Um, and so, you know, that was that was the context in which the, the, the commission was working with an air of like with the folklore of Ireland Society, which Tlargi also established, set up in 1927. The, um, the, the motto of that is from the Gospel of John. It says, collect the fragments let, that remain lest they perish. And that was the idea that, that these fragments are in danger of perishing. So into that context, when Disney kind of comes over in the 1950s, Tlargi is very much interested, I guess, in showing him the you know, the real deal, the genuine sort of tradition. Um, but again, I suppose he's interested in making <clears throat> Hollywood movies, hence, you know, Darby O'Gill or whatever. Mm. Yeah, it's um, it's fascinating because some of the there things was... in Darby O'Gill aren't even real. As it, well, sorry, not... not the, yeah. Not, not the, but it's, when I was growing up, like, leprechauns weren't really a thing. That was more like an American thing. It is, yeah, yeah. got yeah. in Darby O'Gill and the Headless Horseman. Never really heard about that really in Irish culture. So there's a lot there of were, things in there. Yeah, there were, there, there were, there, sorry, go on, yeah. I was going to say, there's a lot of things there that weren't very prominent in Irish culture. Like when I was growing up in the Midlands, it was more about fairies and ring forts and things like that. They were more prominent. The fairies were something not to be kind of really fucked with, you know. There weren't these little twinkly things you'd see on Disney and, you know, they would, you know, tap you a little wand and wish something on you. These were things that would <laughs> fucking fuck you up, like really to put it mildly. Fairies were yeah. were evil things, were and it's this kind of, like you said, a melting back of these different worlds and this kind of crossover at different times, like at Halloween and you know these yeah. type of, these type yeah. of, these type of periods where these times when the two worlds would kind of meet. That was more in where I grew up, but leprechauns not. We kind of just rubbed, rolled our eyes and went, "That that's American shit." Like that's what we kind of said. Yeah, there is an interesting and Americanization of that. <coughs> Excuse me. Of the figure of the leprechaun. I mean, the figure of the leprechaun does exist in Irish tradition. There's a fantastic study has been done with Dermot the Gillan on the topic of the leprechaun in folk tradition. So, what are the different versions? He was known by like the Luharadan and different names in different places. And there is a specific legend that fits into broader kind of European tradition about, um, uh, yeah, this sort of a, a solitary personage of the fairies, say. So, you have in tradition, you have these different groups like the fairy host it was kind of say you can recognize it's just the broad mass of this other world community who are often very much associated and bound up with the world of the dead and they live alongside us in the natural landscape they live in um in the forts and kind of 
old earthwork hills or they live under trees or they live under rocks or at lakes or in lonely places in the natural landscape basically and they often come out at night and they'll you know they play music they have their own cattle they have their own battles against each other they have their own sporting events they have their own kings and queens yeah yeah <coughs> excuse me and so they have all of this this kind of parallel life alongside us and they go out hunting and sometimes mortals kind of get swept up in these affairs and they'll have you know various sorts of fantastic experiences some some benign and positive some very negative and um, sometimes the fairies will kind of encroach onto the, the realm of the, the home they'll come into the home in very kind of strange circumstances in different ways whatever um so the fairy host at large is like the the, the broad community of this kind of this other world community of kind of nature spirits closely bound up with the dead who live alongside us in the natural landscape and then within that you'll have solitary figures so you'll have a body of of lore or, or traditional stories say legends in particular where uh, where a particular um say solitary being features in that story and so the leprechaun would be an example of that the, the banshee, banshee would be yeah. another example yeah where, where you have and they have specific roles so the banshee as a kind of death harbinger another world woman who comes into the locality and she screams and her screams are kind of heard in the local area and they betoken a death in the area and so they often it was said that that she mourned the, or lamented the death of certain families certain noble irish families old irish families basically so narratives regarding her have a certain function for people in the community it's a way of kind of constellation it's a way of um you know, announcing the chaos of death to the community in a way that's kind of given a boundary and a coherence with reference to this traditional figure, for example, in this narrative form. Everyone knows that the Banshee is kind of does this. And so when someone dies, people can kind of relate it back and, you know, everything is in its right right place, essentially. They can explain the world around them in this way with reference to these narratives. And the Leprechaun fits into that in a separate way. Like, so the Leprechaun would be this kind of fairy shoemaker who's found at night and someone who's wandering the road at night would find him working away um, and the basic premise of the narrative involves that he, that he has all this wealth and treasure so there's a huge body of treasure legends in Ireland in general and you kind of catch the spirit and he you get him to tell you kind of where it's buried so he would say you know wrap a ribbon around this this piece of a, a reed in a field or whatever and that's underneath that is where the treasure is and then when you turn away or come back you, you know the next time then there's ribbons in every on every read in the field or whatever so there's a kind of trickster figure um it's a humorous narrative narrative around treasure and stuff like this but it fits into a broader frame of these genuine traditional you know stories and, and legends that were part and parcel of tradition um and we have like we have hundreds and hundreds of accounts of those collected from the from people in, in the folklore collection um but what we have nowadays i suppose when when you mention the leprechaun there's an automatic cringing kind of yeah. response that is elicited. I to try and find it while I'm even explaining the topic here, like um, because it's very, it gives a certain impression, I suppose, of Irishness and Irish culture in a way that um, I was talking earlier about respect. You know what I mean about like the idea of, of having respect for the past or ancestors on this material, and so it would fall far short of that. I guess you know it's a, it's a very oh, yeah. Americanized yeah. idea, that, and that happens a lot, like with different traditions. Think of Halloween as well. Halloween was again, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, but it's also important to bear in mind, like that these traditions are in a state of flux, like they're alive. Tradition is dynamic, and it responds to the environment, and it changes to fit um, the situation in which it's contained. Like so, so in the same way that these traditions often move and go back and forth around different countries in Europe, and they'll they'll cross physical barriers, cross mountains, across oceans, across linguistic and religious and ethnic and racial divides same stories will be found i can give you some crazy examples of that of like stuff from from and kind of early hindu tradition that would be that we can find in irish tradition today um, so really? there's all this kind of strange crossovers um and so in the context say of halloween we would have had like turnip ghosts where they're carved out you can see examples of them in the national museum then with with kind of emigration to the states um, pumpkins were used for Halloween and they're much easier to carve obviously but pumpkins are not a thing in this country yeah. um, and so thank god pumpkin pie is disgusting I hate that stuff <laughs> but then that we're losing are you there 
Tarantino. Beamed back into our. Oh, he's gone on mute. Yeah, the last 10 or 15 seconds are gone yeah. now. Please hold while we, we reconnect your call. You're back in the game now. Hold on. He's on mute. Johnny, Sorry. Can you Did I just hear the bombs gone? Yeah, yeah, am I back? Yeah, we had you, we had you, we had you, pumpkin pie was horrible, and then all the Americans cut the phone lines. <laughs> oh, savage. Um, so I was just saying, <laughs> ultimately, apart from, it down. <laughs> yeah, apart from just saying, I discussed some pumpkin pies. That the, these question pump, the, the question pumpkin pie is the question, <laughs> Anthony Fauci. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> shut it down, shut it down. So, um, the uh, <laughs> the the idea being basically that all of these traditions are in a state of flux. That's the important thing to bear in mind. And that they're in a state of transition and continuity and change all the time. Um, but yeah, for us growing up, like like you're saying, I think it can relate to a lot of that. We've been the idea of the fairies, you know, it's it, that they live in some, there'd be a fort at the edge of the town or somewhere outside, just beyond where you live. Right, let's hold, and, on, there uh, for, let's hold on there for a minute before we go into fairy forts, right? Let's just put yeah, it, yeah. because a lot of people want and um, won't understand this if they're listening to this from you know outside of Ireland. Let's okay. just let's just delve on this fairies or this other world, like we said, it lives powered out to us. And like you said, they live in these areas. Now, Karen, let me ask you, Karen. You're how old are you, Karen? Thir 30. 32. 32. So Karen's a little bit younger than me. <laughs> I won't tell you by how much. <laughs> when you were growing up, Karen, would you go into a fairy fort on your own? I love this. I yeah. love this. Yeah, see it. It would. <laughs> yeah, like I I I've always you definitely think about it. And but I don't know why that's the case. I don't know how much because I definitely have a think about it because it's all it's kind of like, but I don't know why. I don't know if it's like a respect thing or there's there's like there's there's um yeah there's definitely a there a would have been a resistance there and there's actually there's even a fairy fort at the top of a hill that I can see across from where I live. There's another hill as a fairy fort at the top of it, and I didn't know it was there until we looked at the hill at a map from a map, and it's a fucking huge fairy. It must be, I don't know, it could be 50, 80 meters in diameter. Maybe maybe it could be eighty meters across. Like it's, it's big. I didn't realize what because it was so big. I didn't realize what it was, and we'd actually walk through it before and um but yeah and, and then you just you encounter and it was, this is actually a question that i was I, it was a relation to this it was specifically around fairy force because and there was another point uh but i suppose it might add to this question that that, that ian was about to ask and um, which i don't which i assume he was about to ask but what's the crack with fairy force <laughs> mythologically because what i find absolutely fascinating is that in Ireland, we had obviously lots of, uh, we had 800 odd years of the whole British thing. And then on top of that, we also had uh, really intense Christianity. But yet, what I find absolutely fascinating is that a lot of these local myths and, uh, and uh, are these parochial mythologies and traditions that are you could you could kind of think of as like a, a parallel structure, a parallel kind of way of myth mythopoetically or like religiously thinking ran alongside the Catholicism, but it, and it managed to be strong enough that it was maintained throughout the whole of the thousand years of Christianity or what, however long it was that the that basically all of all of Ireland was was um, part of Christendom. So I was like. The fact fairy forts are just an obvious example because they'll divert fucking motorways and everything not to dig up a fairy fort, like you know. And what 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 is, so what is what is the crack? What is the the story? What's the, the <laughs> what's happening the, there? What's going on with that? What's the the potency of the the fairy fort that five, rings so true even to this day? They'll divert fucking motorways to to go around them for five seconds. For anybody's watching this on YouTube, I have this I have this great book here, which is about fairy forts. That's a brilliant book, Schneider right. Mercer, The Many We Ring Forts. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, got, I bought this off Eddie Lennon and he was able to send it over to me. So just so people can see. Yeah. It's a fantastic book. That's what a ring fort is. That, that's, that's an aerial shot, just so you know. It's not like this castle type of thing. Don't envisage like King Arthur and people trying to keep people out. It can be just like a, a kind of a, a ring of dirt. Earthwork maybe. mound. Earthwork yeah. mound, two to three feet high, if even that, and generally encircled with trees as well. Yeah. 
So, <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's, it's really bloody fascinating. Like, and what you're saying, I mean, there's so much going on there, even in what you described in that question. And it is really interesting to think what the hell is going on there in that, for example, you describe, you know, as a kid, say, if you're going to go just <clears throat> traverse into the fields behind your gaff, behind your house and, and walk into a fairy fort, you will stop and think before you do, or maybe you won't even go, or maybe, you know, but there will be a hesitance. This is the thing I've asked before. I've asked people, I remember um, giving a talk uh, a few years ago and it, it was in Poland. So there was a mixture of Polish and Irish people there. And I remember saying, somebody asked about, do people still believe this sort of stuff? A, a Polish person, they didn't ask it in a derogatory way. They were just inquiring. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was saying that a lot of people in Ireland today, if you ask them outright, do you believe in the fairies? They kind of, they'd laugh in your face or say, you know, of course not, or whatever. But then if you ask them a more pointed thing, like, would you go and cut down a hawthorn tree on a fairy fort in your land or something? And people would stop and think, or they'd grow a bit pale, mm -hmm. or they'd kind of, mm, uh, they probably wouldn't. So, so there's a kind of, and again, it's not to say that people secretly have this really strong belief, but sometimes you have a kind of a passive belief that isn't only activated in certain situations and you just hesitate. And there's a lot of cultural sediment and kind of knowledge there that you're not even privy to or aware of yourself necessarily. But there's a few things going on in what you're describing there, what you're asking, Kieran. So like one of the things that, again, this is Dahio, to go back to, to the great, the late great Dahio Hogan, one of the things I remember him, him writing about was uh, the idea that... Um, with the invasion of the Celts, when the Celts arrived, the, the country had already had these kind of um, uh, other kind of migrations and, and population groups in it. And so, for example, all of the old dolmens and kind of stone forts, the impressive passage tombs and Neolithic tombs and stuff like that, the Celts didn't make those. I mean, we don't know very much really about the people who, about the culture and kind of language and customs and so on of the people who did construct those huge um, stone forts, places like Newgrange and things like this. So unbelievably advanced they oh. must have been engineering yeah, ones. Yeah, yeah. And, and yeah, very strange kind of stuff. Astronomy to be <coughs> able so, to map these things to different times of the year really precisely. Crazy. Like Newgrange is a phenomenon. Like how the fuck yeah, 5,000 yeah, years so, ago that it's so precise. Yeah, yeah. It's a weird solar computer almost. Like it's very strange. But, but yeah. so when the Celts arrived with their kind of I would say like warrior aristocracy ethic or whatever, a kind of cattle raiding and the kind of Indo-European tradition, or whatever, when they came and um, they, yeah, there's Bruno Boyne. So they, they basically, his, uh, his suggestion was that, um, that first of all, they kind of ransacked these population groups, basically massacred or whatever, got rid of those people basically disappeared. There's some interbreeding with the, with the people, the Celts who, who came to Ireland became the Irish people or whatever. Um, but, that, uh, that basically they would have seen a lot of these abandoned sites and kind of old earthwork forts and that they may have situated the kind of the gods of the older population groups there and had a certain trepidation or fear. That was one of the speculations that, that he had around the arrival of the Celts to Ireland onto a land that already had these kind of um, uh, derelict kind of zones, basically. And they, they inhabited the deity, their own deities or the deities of the old gods in those places. And with that went a certain taboo or sense of trepidation around approaching them and so on. But always, always the idea of the fairy fort is somewhere that's it's in the natural landscape, right? These earthwork mounds, these rings of trees, even trees that look like they weren't planted by a human hand, so-called fairy trees, a tree that stands out on its own in the middle of the field. Don't go near that tree. Don't cut it down. Don't take... Uh, branches from it for fuel just don't fuck around with it basically and there are there are huge amounts of um traditional narratives that that back that idea up of somebody who comes and he plows a fairy fort to make more arable land for his farm and he suffers rack and ruin and disaster his family die his livestock die all sorts of horrible stuff happens to him so you find again and again and again there's a taboo there's kind of moral censure in our tradition against interference with these lonely places in the natural landscape. And so as a result of that, we have huge amounts of them um, are left untouched in a state often of dereliction as opposed to necessary kind of respect. Uh, sometimes actually, as Sinead mentions in that book that you have there, Ian, that they're often, they have been destroyed. And, and although there's kind of a law against it, nothing often is done in this country, so it seems, around it. But um, so the idea, I suppose, on one hand, you have this this other world community who are who are rooted in the natural landscape but the word she the word that we have for fairies si father she og is a fairy or an unslew she the fairy host that she that come that that 
that word used to mean um, a death mound, a burial mound, a death heap, a cairn, a kind of stone oh. um, mound it's of stones that was for the dead. Long, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so the word, and even banshee, you know, other world woman. Like, so so the, the, the word that's used for the fairies in its older form was used to describe the, the dead, the world of the dead in a way. So there's always this crossover with the world of the dead and the world of the fairies. There'd be narratives regarding, say, a guy who's walking out late at night and he sees a funeral coming along the road, you know, at midnight, which is kind of quite a strange sight to see. And as he stops and does the, the traditional kind of thing was to stop, turn and walk three steps with the funeral as it kind of, if you're going the other way with it, out of respect. But as he's looking around at the mourners, he notices kind of strange people, but everybody also notices many of the dead from his own community in their number. So he, he notices dead people attending this funeral and it's a fairy funeral, essentially. So you'll have a countless versions of these types of narratives um, where, where someone out on the lateral landscape visits this place, um, maybe breaks a rule, breaks a taboo, whatever, and, and has this kind of strange experience with this other world community. But overall, it's, it roots us in our attitude to the natural landscape. Um, it shows a certain trepidation and kind of taboo around interfering with these places. And the idea basically is that there are spirits living there and that, that you need to kind of respect them and, and uh, don't interfere with them. Even the idea that you mentioned a Christian context as well. Like that's really interesting because with the fairy host, there's no, there was never any, <clears throat> any kind of, uh, conflict with Christian tradition and the existence of the fairies, mm. because the, the 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 way that they were the way that they were accounted for was through um, uh, Lucifer's rebellion against God, and when he was cast out from heaven into hell, mm. all of the angels who rebelled with him were cast out as well, until God at a certain point relented and said, "Okay, leave them where they are." So the spirit, the angels, the, the spirits that were in the air are still in the air; they're the airy spirits. Uh, the spirits that were in the water are still in the water and the sea and in lakes and stuff. And then those that were on the land or in the natural landscape, they're still there wandering around. And those are the fairies, basically. And they'll keep wandering around until the last day, until the day of judgment, and they're trying to get back into heaven. There's another legend, the fairies' prospect of salvation, basically, where they're, they're, they come and accost this guy who's working on a Sunday, and they ask him to tell him what's the fairies' prospect of salvation. And, and this guy goes to the priest for advice, and he tells him um, basically to kind of to essentially kind of dig a grave for yourself and put the the spade and cut your tools over it in the form of a cross and hop into it with that protection and then give him the answer and tell him there's no chance that you have no prospect of salvation and so this this huge kind of explosion this very disappears off in, in a kind of shower of fire and sparks and stuff like this so they again you know even when you meet them in the natural landscape sometimes they look like ordinary men and women you know i've seen interesting accounts of um, a guy working in his field and describing kind of at dusk three guys in suits at the end of the field is kind of quite an ominous description. So they're not like little people. Sometimes they're described as little people, but they're often described as, um, you, you wouldn't know if you're interacting with them. You might be talking to your neighbor or think you're talking to your wife and you aren't. You're talking to, to the fairy, one of the fairies, basically. But in the context of, of Christendom and Christian tradition, you know, the early, the early Christian kind of um, uh, form in Ireland took its, took its, its shape and form in many ways from, from the same one that the kind of orthodox tradition would, I think, take its, it, it from today. It's like that of the Desert Fathers, these kind of ascetic monastics who disappeared off into um, strange landscapes, places like Shkedig Vihil, to pray, to meditate, to be close to God or whatever. And that was the, the, the Christian tradition here. It wasn't the, it wasn't the Roman parochial tradition until mm. a bit later. It, it, initially, it was this very monastic and tradition of different different uh, monks, nuns, and in and in these abbeys and, and around the country, and so with that, I suppose there maybe there, there was a different a different type of, um, of Christian tradition. Yeah, in a sense, yeah, yeah, and he and again the other you mentioned parallel kind of lines. The, the way that I think of this sometimes is even in, as opposed to a kind of left right parallelism, but a kind of up down parallel where you have the official doctrine and dogma of the church and then you have the unofficial expressions of folk religiosity again because as i described folklore at the start of the podcast here that it's like unofficial informal traditional communal um and any cultural expression that that has those kind of characteristics 
and religion is no different. So when we think of folk religion, it's the informal, um, unofficial expressions of those of those kind of traditional practices and customs. So even if it's um, visiting holy wells or honoring certain saints, whatever, that maybe the the formal church wouldn't recognize in the same way. Well, there were still often practices where people would um, would express their faith in 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 those those kind of ways. So there's a lot more intermingling and kind of I think as well, I'm kind of going off into tangents here, all of our written sources, all of the early literature that we have, all of the early accounts of the mythological cycle, the Ulster cycle, the Fenian cycle, the cycles of different champions, and heroes and kings, and, and it was all written by early Christian monks. The written word is a Christian kind of vehicle, technology, really, in our tradition. And before that, it was it was the unwritten oral, it was a taboo against writing, you know, in, 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 the, in the older kind of, conditions of culture which really focused on the role of spoken and the role of 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 memory basically and um, so mm. the tradition that comes down to us is filtered down through the lens of 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 Christ, christendom christian tradition really since since the earliest phase and i think often because of maybe more contemporary reasons there's there's a um a desire to kind of separate out or, or move away from that in contemporary ireland it means many People, I suppose, the, the you know the navigate feelings of Irishness with relation to kind of being post-Catholic or living in a kind of collapsed faith, or whatever. Um, but when you look at the traditions and the different practices and narratives and customs and things that come down to us, there's a lot more intermingling of the apparently pre-Christian with the Christian into this into this kind of uh, a synthesis of sorts. You know, think of the the colloquy of the elders, this 12th century uh, manuscript where Saint Patrick. Is walking around Ireland with Quilte. He's one of the last of the the, the Fenian kind of heroes, the Fianna. And um, when he meets this guy, the Quilte or Ushing, I can't remember which of them exactly. When Saint Patrick meets him, he's got these thousands of demons swirling over his head because he's this old kind of pagan warrior. So Patrick immediately, you know, boop, banishes all the demons, and then they go walking around Ireland and um, and talking about, you know, what what did you guys used to do? So it's this, it's Christianity mm, bridge. In, dialogue with with yeah with the older kind of pagan pagan tradition so um Ooh. so there's a lot there with the fairies with 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 it's like the natural landscape ideas around the dead ideas around the other world the mundane world of visible reality the strange kind of fantastic other world that surrounds us all the time when does that bleed into our world and and how there's a whole landscape of taboo and moral behavior that you kind of shouldn't interfere with these places and then there is an overlap with with religious observance, with traditional kind of ideas around, um, yeah, the dead, the saints. Like you said, I like what you said about parochial mythologies. Whatever, it's a really nice, a nice way of putting it. So, um, a lot of this is very local, but as you zoom out, there's a coherence between it, and it it, it mm. takes on this kind of national um, uh, structure, a much broader kind of network or web as well. So. <laughs> I think I've kind of half answered or not answered yeah, no. 10 different questions there. As a, as a quick, well, I don't know how quick it's going to be, but as a follow-up, that actually a question that I was really interested in, it's along these lines, and you alluded to both sides of it um, in that, but I just thought if, if there was any specific examples of, so the role of Christianity, but I suppose maybe even more precisely based on what you just said there, Catholicism maybe in one suppressing certain components that would have conflicted with that um, ide ideology in terms of afterlife or, you know, because like an example in Norse mythology would be the whole Valhalla <coughs> and die, in a, die a good death in battle and you might get selected by the Valkyrie to go to Valhalla, etc. Like you know that there's this equivalent of a kind of like, and you wait then for Ragnarok and you get to have another fucking scrap with the earth serpent or whatever. You know, this kind Savage. of, it's, it's two stories, it's this, so as that stuff obviously directly conflicts with Christianity because it's another afterlife that's not a Christian heaven. So it's the kind of thing that if Christi mm -hmm. Christianity comes in, that stuff then is quickly demoted to just bedtime stories kind of stuff, you know, rather than a way of thinking about making sense of reality, making sense of the death of a loved one, etc. So is there anything that one, Christianity, but maybe more specifically, if, if it was the case, that Catholicism, or maybe even early Christianity, one suppressed in terms of main, in terms of examples that might jump to mind, or two specific examples of, um, I think you've mentioned a few there already, but absorption of pre-existing 
pagan mythologies. Like, for example, I might be incorrect here, but as far as, far as I remember, like Saint Bridget is is, a, is originally come. That's that the Catholic, the Christian Saint Bridget is actually just an adopted, amalgamated Christian flavored story of an earlier like female druid kind of character, not whatever the equivalent of a female druid was. That was that was basically so. Is that is I'm, I, I don't know if that's correct, but I have this fragment of a memory that, that around Saint Bridget in particular. So I was wondering if yeah, you had any thoughts about on, one yeah. suppressing no, and two fun. absorbing. It's a fascinating question, and I'd say, <coughs> in the context of of say suppression, you don't need to look too far. Like, and you can look actually at some of the traditions and doctrines of the not really not doctrines, but the traditions associated with the life of the faithful themselves. Most most recently, I would say in the early to mid twentieth century, the suppression of wakes wake games that was really common around Ireland, where the wake mm. being the kind of spending time with the body of, of the newly deceased. And so the tradition in Ireland, which is a very um, a very worthwhile and useful one, a way to grieve is to spend time with the body of the deceased as soon as after they've died. So, you know, we're kind of our cousins across the water in England have a very different approach to death there, where it can be weeks and weeks before before the body is kind of released to the family and then it's, just, it's, it's the funeral and then that's it. Whereas as soon as a person dies in this country, really, they're they're kind of, as soon as can be possible, they're released back to the house and the wake is held and there's an open casket and family come and visit and there's a whole kind of, the grieving process kind of begins. But in the early 20th century, there were a lot of very rowdy, bawdy, apparently disrespectful games that took place at those uh, events. And the reason being for that, that was posited by Sean O'Sullivan, who's the archivist for the Folklore Commission, he suggested the idea that essentially that the community wanted to kind of to keep the dead on side, basically to make them, let them know that they were still part of the communal kind of fun and that they weren't being ignored or whatever. He puts it in a lot more elo eloquent terms than that. But essentially at these wakes, there were a lot of um, very body, very uh, crazy games, really. You know, the, the corpse sometimes would have would be sat up in the coffin, it would be given a hand of cards, it would be given a drink of whiskey, it would be given a pipe to smoke, <laughs> stuff like this. There's yeah. all sorts of, there's a book, Irish Wake Amusements by Shona Sudivan, where he describes this, oh. and then different kind of rowdy physical games that would take part among the um, those in attendance as well. There's that a was book, active. A, a specific, a, sorry, Johnny, a specific book on it. Irish, Irish Wake, Wake Amusements. Amusements by Sean O'Sullivan. Yeah, Sean O'Sullivan. <laughs> oh, I, I, I got I to gotta get the Irish Wake Amusements. Yeah, because <laughs> that he was a the book. That's, yeah, get that. he, he was the archivist at the Folklore Commission. He designed the whole system by which we arrange our collections. He's a total hero, a total hero. But, um, but so that was actively suppressed by the church because the feeling was that this is just totally inappropriate. This won't do, basically. And so that was put down. And so the Wake today is a more prosaic affair. It still maintains this kind of communal role in, in communal kind of grievance and coming together and so on. But we're not uh, kind of disrespecting the body in the same way and doing the things that we used to do. Another example you could see maybe, again, related to religiosity <clears throat> would be the pattern days, the pattern days of the so-called, again, to talk about, Kieran, what you mentioned of, of parochial mythologizing would be, say, the celebration of a local patron saint that's where the pattern comes from you need the patron saint who looks over a certain parish and a lot of the pattern days would have become very secular affairs by the 19th century there would have been what started as kind of pilgrimages and votive offerings at wells or rounds at certain places and lots of prayer and so on there would have still been that element but it they became they degenerated into um kind of market fairs and there'd be faction fighting and drinking and carousing to the point where again the church actively suppressed and put put a lot of that kind of stuff down really so that was in more in more recent times in more kind of practical mundane terms say of like the institution actively trying to intervene to kind of change behaviors in certain ways but you mentioned something else about the kind of valkyries <clears throat> and say in the context of non-christian ideas of, of death and the the most striking example of that i think that we have in irish tradition which is still really very much alive today and not just in, an, in, a, in a rural context, but in an urban context, you ask anyone, maybe not anyone, but you ask a lot of people in cities and towns, never mind the country today, do you believe in the Banshee? People will unironically say, yep, 100% and I've heard her. I've heard her before mm. my father died or my auntie died or whatever. And so um, the Banshee is, as, a, as a figure is has been described by Patricia Lysis, um, uh, who's the, the world authority on the Banshee. There's another book, you should get the Banshee by Patricia Lysis. 
um, she described her as very a Christian. You know, this, this other world woman who comes across from the other world emanates out of the other world and either to lament a death, basically just before somebody dies, she comes in to the local area and she will be heard screaming. So often she's not heard, so often she's not seen, but she's heard and she'll scream and scream and lament the death of this person. Um, but her lament is often one that makes no reference to heaven. It makes no reference to the, <clears throat> the consolations of the church or the saints or the faith of the part of whatever. All of her, her, her lamentations are around the hero's life, you know, the hero's life in the countryside. And so he departs then. And so that's a kind of structure that's, that fits into the communal way that we understand grief or that the chaos of death is interpreted and understood at the initial like moment of its occurring in Irish custom and Irish tradition. That's what mm. we do. We, we, we reference the banshee and she comes out, one of your own coming to take you away to the other side. And then after the wake and the funeral, it's over to the consolations of the church and the saints and the faithful departed and so on. But the initial, the initial kind of structure or her role is a very a Christian manifestation of this idea of death. And so that's, that's part and parcel of Irish tradition now excuse me it's kind of wrapped up into who we are and what we do and and it has that that part in the death story in the life cycle in Irish tradition we fit her in there and she fits very neatly and um, but she's not a Christian construct in in any way mm. she doesn't refer to that that kind of world and really if you look back to the older kind of um, the older, you know, she's known as the bow in different parts of the country and from Bive, from Scald, Crow, um, and it's this older kind of death harbinger goddess that's mentioned in, in early Irish literature. Um, so she has all these kind of, again, pre-Christian or a-Christian antecedent forms that are, that totally sit neatly in the, in the overall kind of Irish tradition, really, that, that, uh, that we just accept now. And again, that's not something that um, people kind of <clears throat> ironically pretend to believe in or whatever there's a there's still a very active tradition of belief around around the banshee from certainly from my experience of conducting field work oh, and yeah. chatting to people and not even that but from family members and and again even experiences i've had myself that where it fits into that frame um i remember waking years ago before or uh, one of my missus's family members died and waking up in the middle of the night and hearing three screams out on the street thinking Jesus what the hell is this uh, and then nothing you know, they're going back asleep and then the next morning this this uh, 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 Shinoid's cousin had passed away I'd been ill in hospital whatever and so the mind goes back to this kind of as a reference point you know what I mean and so again constantly in these narratives as well one of the distinctions that's made people would say ah oh, it was a cat screaming or a person screaming or whatever one of the things you often hear when people describe the accounts of the banshee that see it was an unearthly wail or an unearthly moan. There's always this distancing from um, it wasn't an animal screaming or it wasn't a, mm. or, or a person or whatever. This this reference is always made to the unearthliness of these things. So a lot of these things, there are kind of references and triggers that fit back into our own minds that we're often not even aware of, of the, the kind of the cultural landscape that we're wandering around in. But um, yeah, Christian tradition overall, I think, would have both absorbed and uh, mo mostly absorbed, I think, some of what existed before. You mentioned Saint Bridget, perfect example. Like she, she was the daughter of the Daija, the good god of the the two headed Danann. Those are the the race of deities that inhabited Ireland before we came here, and we had a battle with them, and they went under the ground. And that's again one of the reasons for that's where the fairy, that's where the fairies apparently live. And um, the Daija, the Daija had three daughters: Breed, 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 Brigid, Brigid, and Brigid, and it must have made Chris Christmas. Very confusing, as a friend and colleague of mine used to say. But um, the idea was that you know she was a patroness of of smith workers, of protector of livestock, um, of uh, poets and so on. And she had her, I suppose, the the festival at which she was venerated was Imbolc, and Imbolc being on the first of February, meaning like in the womb and in the belly, so referring to the study of pregnancy. Um, and later on, then in when when there's the woman who uh, born in Fahart in Louth in the 4th century, 5th century, who Christianized her tribe. And she took the name of Bridget. She took the name of Breed, exalted one, high one, lofty one, which is what Breed means. Um, and she took the name of the kind of the, the, the goddess of that or that figure uh, as her name. Uh, and then she started what was the, 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 the abbey, the monastery of Kildare. 
So again, was you know the first kind of um, one of these kind of I suppose showing the, the the role of women at the earliest phase of the Christian Church in Ireland. So she took over that kind of role, and then it, there's a continuity of that role through her now in a different phase in a different guise. So those energies are still they're still being um, worshipped or venerated now through this new new channel, and that's still again that's the case today, even in a again a society that with, that would reference itself as being largely living in a state of kind of collapsed faith where people would talk about St. Bridget again unironically with with great devotion and, and, and love I think for her more so than St. Patrick it seems more like a kind of legalistic yeah. practical you know dogmatic church figure but St. Bridget is a living breathing um, uh, saint goddess that, peop that people all over the country worship she's also the only one in the country who she visits every house on the dawn and the morning of her feast with her driving a kind of a cow before her so you know she's but again there are all sorts of you can you can look at all sorts of much older um indo-european traditions regarding her as well so a lot of these energies kind of get rolled up and continue on in different forms and so on so, um, so that, that, that's a perfect segue into what I, what I want to talk about next johnny on energy but before i move on to energy if anybody this conversation is moving so fast even for me and i talk a million miles an hour but this is brilliant there's lots of stuff be sure to go over and check out Johnny's podcast, which we'll put the link in the show notes because Johnny has done an episode on St. Patrick. He's done an episode on St. Bridget. He's also recently done an episode with, I think it was David McGowan, uh, the Undertaker guy, talking about funerals in Ireland. So a lot of these topics, if you want to explore them in a lot of depth, go to that podcast because Johnny really gets into them and you can take each one of these Johnny's like doing the 30,000 foot view at the moment, giving us this like big net that we can, we can pull down the strands on. But there is, you know, I don't know, 40, 50 hours or more over there of this content. So go over there and listen to any of these ones that you, that you would like um, to, to, to pick on. So I just want to make that. The other thing, Johnny, thinking about energy is, and I want to pick up on some, the, the dog that, the dog that actually lived, was supposed to live in Newgrange, correct? Yeah, yeah. In the Bruna Bond, in, which in, in the Newgrange, had three daughters, mm -hmm. and there's three chambers within inside Newgrange as well. Mm -hmm. So you see mm -hmm. lots of things like getting stories, like having similarities with the land and energy and so on. There was also like mythology and folklore, uh, mythology, sorry, about what, are, I, what the difference is. Well, we should pick on that as well about what happened at mm -hmm. Newgrange that, you know, basically that the dog that married. Um, I think it was the was it the son Angus married someone that was related to him and so on. And then in the last couple of years, bones that were excavated from that place <coughs> from Newgrange in the 60s were analyzed recently and it actually found out people buried in Newgrange from 5,000 years ago were actually related. But we had stories in our culture over 5,000 yeah. years that had said that. Like to me, that is unbelievable. So how is this yeah, kind of crazy. energy? <coughs> I suppose if we can talk a little bit about energy in this kind of way in terms of the verbal energy that goes through, but also then with these landmarks, like the Bruna Boyne area has to be, have some sort of significant energy in it. Um, how does this tie in with fairy forts and ley lines that people may talk about in other countries, these energy lines or channels, um, which people would say is a lot of woo woo. And as a PhD in science, I'll probably get laughed at when I run to my fellow scientists, but there's a lot of stuff here that, seems to have a lot of similarities it's really strange and i mm. the word i use was is energy can you can you kind of speculate on this a bit if you have any thoughts on it yeah yeah i mean it's it's in the context of what you're saying in bruno boni it's really strange like there there are references <coughs> excuse me there's references to um to incest but historically mm. basically and just some of the names of, of these chambers and places um and it was found then in the in exhumed bodies that they're that that the bones were buried there are the result of I forget the exact terms, like a first order incest or something where it's yeah, either, yeah. it's like a father, daughter or brother, yeah. sister, something like that. And this is something to do with this old royal lineage. Royal bloodlines, now, I think, see, yeah. again, yeah, maintaining these bloodlines. And But these are the people who, again, weren't the Celts. You know what I mean? These are the people which we don't, we, don't, we don't know. Yeah, this is the kind of the, yeah. the um, uh, you know, no, like there's the kind of Stonehenge thing of like nobody knows who they were or what they were doing, kind of stuff. That's basically that we, we don't really have a huge amount of information about those. There's something about super that sad about that 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 yeah. just it's this really dark side of human civilization mm. and history at large is just that 
the, the, the history is written by the winners and if you're better at murdering people and you're better at organizing into military groups, you're just going to end up taking, you just, you're, it's your, you control the narrative. There's a really mm-hmm. unfortunate, there's a really unfortunate reality to violence, I suppose, <laughs> more than yeah. just the barbarism of the moment and how it is <laughs> to get hacked up by a sword. Also, the loss of wisdom and the loss of tradition, the loss of mm. culture that happens when peoples get wiped out. You know, like yep. it's yeah, fucking... yeah, it is, it is, and it's part. I suppose, like you said, it's part and parcel of um, of the reality of the age in which we find ourselves. At least, I mean, <coughs> excuse me, to talk of, of energy and stuff like it is difficult. It, it's difficult to. I mean, obviously, people generally want to be kind of guarded about these things and not really. Like you're saying, Ian, it's like things are regarded as kind of woo-woo or whatever. But I think all of us who have any sort of sensitivity, like when you're when you're walking through the natural landscape and you're in nature and you feel the presence of the past, you feel the spirit of, I don't know, creation around you, whatever. You can't not be moved by that, like by sunsets, sunrises, and the movements of animals, the, just the, the observing the heavens around you. Like you can't, it's, it's, it's insane, this world in which we find ourselves. It's unfathomable. We're consistently surrounded by the boundless and the unfathomable and we're trying to embody it and give boundary to it in some meaningful way to just work out what the fuck is going on <laughs> yeah, at, yeah, at yeah. some yeah. essential level like yeah. what is this what is this thing like and so yeah it's a very confounding um mystery we're surrounded by mystery and it's something that in the modern age again has been I think that this is not what you're, the question you're asking necessarily has been stripped out, sandblasted, stripped away yeah, in the light of yeah. kind of cold rationalism and reason, uh, which doesn't serve any meaningful purpose. It doesn't answer the why or of, of being anymore. There's this kind of giant technical colossus that we can absorb, where we can, we can observe in great detail, but, but kind of peering behind it, there's a nothingness, there's a void. There's so much of, of modern and contemporary life where that energy in that you reference is stripped away or it's not recognized or that's it's not or if it is it's kind of it's brushed off it's shrugged away as the kind of momentary lapse of reason or something like that you know what mm-hmm. i mean where but actually i think in many ways what we need to be doing is 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 and this is where some of the benefit of the type of material that we're talking about of again if it's parochial mythologizing or more it's if it's looking at local traditions or or traditions more broadly it's to it's to try and reconnect with that spirit of beauty of mystery that surrounds us and to be rooted in place to give because these these narratives these customs these structures provide meaning they they, they orient us they're kind of like north stars by which we can mm. you know sail our ship or whatever as opposed to as opposed to sailing in a kind of starless night a black void uh, unbeknownst to ourselves kind of amnesiacs who just cast memory overboard heave it overboard like ballast um, because it's slowing us down we need to move faster and faster and liberate ourselves from ourselves into what into nothingness like a lot of the the, the ideas are kind of casting off the oppressive shackles of tradition that kind of that restrict and oppress us i think is in, is a is a misguided i think oftentimes what we find when we when we do that when we when we cut those 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 t- we cut the ties that bind we cut the life-giving cords that sustain we cut the kind of the 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 um that which connects us to to the source of meaning in life, basically. So, mm. I, I think I there's a lot. Greek... Sorry, oh, I was sorry, just going to say that because of a, there's a Greek example of that, which is like, and I, I couldn't agree with you more strongly. Like uh, that kind of impulse that we have is something I put a lot of research and reading and writing into. Something I'm writing about at the moment, actually, and it. I think the the route you can very most recently you can trace back quite. I think. In a very, in a potentially overly, overly simplistic way, is to the uh, Enlightenment kind of focus, where the Enlightenment focus would have been on essentially, uh, it, it knowledge-wise, the focus would have been on uh, propositional, transferable knowledge, which is only one form of knowledge, and that's the rational, the logical. It's lo- it's information and knowledge that I can transfer to you by telling you it or by showing you something. But what the Enlightenment did in, in focusing on that, there was a time at which it, there was a necessity to it at the time because there would have been a cultural legacy of the untransferable already. There would have been all this cultural stuff going on that would have been a grounding in place and exposure to the environment and exposure to tradition that would have been part of you know, Scotland and France, etc., where there would have been these big Enlightenment hubs. 
But then as that stuff starts to become the dominant way at which we view, and you can understand why that was the case, because the Enlightenment, I think of it as symbolic, like it was a double-edged sword where it simultaneously cut away what were kind of oppressive, basically uh, Catholic and religious uh, kind of shackles that were chaining down the human ability to seek truth independent of what authority says. And there would have been a bit of space created by the Protestant Reformation where the Catholic Church was, there was a bit of space created between Western civilization and the Catholic Church by the Protestant Reformation that disturbed things a bit. And then there would have been the scientific revolution that then would have made it more and more feasible and justifiable because of the things that could be built to be able to seek truth that then would have all, all fed in to create a bit of space that ended up in things like the rule of law and the growth of democracy around the Western world, et cetera, that would have helped to democratize truth seeking and democratize and, th and movements around freedom of speech and freedom of expression and et cetera. And, that, and then that would have led to this acceleration of eventual human freedom in loads of different domains, like the abolition of slavery and all this kind of stuff would have been created and it would have all stemmed. But the shadow side of that is it also cut a God-shaped hole or a religion or mythology, a mythopoetic shaped hole in Western civilization because it just totally brushed aside anything that wasn't rational, logical, transferable knowledge. And it basically yeah. put everything below rationality as below rational, anything other than rationality as, as irrational and hence bad. But the thing about it is, rationality that, that, that might have been all very well and good when there was traditions that were irrational traditions that were serving to still ground you in place and ground you in culture but then over time as those traditions start to pa start to recede and ireland almost kind of the way that i heard matisse Choutin, who's like a ecologist that teaches in ucc sometimes i heard him on oh, the almanac yeah. of ireland that's and he yeah, put it, yeah. really, it was class and he put it yeah. really well which is that basically <laughs> Ireland, because of the, and he didn't specifically elaborate, but this is what I think he was getting to. He put this really interesting way of putting it where basically Ireland jumped from pre-modernism to post-modernism without ever going through a modern period where we, because we, because we kept the Catholicism <laughs> the whole way through. And then all of a sudden we're at blind boy both. You know, it's like there was just basically within 20 years, we went from Catholic Ireland to blind boy. And like in over the course of three decades, whatever, from the 1990s and, so this, whereas I think thinkers like modern thinkers, like some of the most, one of the most important thinkers is someone who if you haven't come across, I think you'd absolutely love what he's about is a guy, Ian McGilchrist, who wrote this book, The Master and His Emissary. And he has these new books called The Matter with Things. But his, he has it. this argument as coming from a place of uh, psychiatry as his background, but he's basically a polymath. What? <laughs> They're there behind you. Show them the books. Oh, yeah. They, they're, the size they're, of them. Those, those two books, the, <laughs> the blue one and the red one there, they're massive. They're like 1,500 pages between the two. It took them 11 years to write. But, uh, 10, I'll, actually, years I'll, to write actually, I'll actually put a lecture into the show notes from Ian McGilchrist at Ralston College. I've listened to it now four times. Daddy. And it's brilliant with some Q&A from Ralston College, Stephen Blackwood. And Stephen Blackwood was a guest previously on this post podcast interview by Kieran on his own. So I'd put that in, but it's really mm. good. And I think, Karen, you're bang on the money. Johnny will yeah. love Ian McGilchrist. Yeah, because what Ian's, Ian has this thing, mm. he has a focus that, and I, that basically it's a big, a, big, a big problem with our culture is that, and, and it relates to this enlightenment focus where I used to have a very rose-tinted glasses view of the enlightenment as someone who's a scientist and very interested in scientific thinking and, and technology and, and engineering and, and everything. But the thing about it is, it's not rational, logical, scientific, falsifiable knowledge that's going to stop you from walking at the fence in, an elect in a concentration camp just to commit suicide and take the easy way out. Like, the rational isn't what allows us to actually live. It's not the rational that allows us to navigate struggle, to overcome difficulty, to overcome adversity. Like, life yeah, totally. is inherently yeah. irrational. Because we bring into existence children that we know must perish, but we can only hope might flourish. Like existence mm -hmm. itself is irrational. Like pain and suffering and death are, the, are basically the, the closest guarantees you have in life and much less guaranteed, much less certain than any of pain, suffering and death are going to be the meaning, the purpose, the fulfillment, the joy, the play that actually justifies life. But we're hoping that might happen every time that someone has a kid. 
But we're, that's a hope. That's a faith. That's not rational. Like the most rational to do is for everyone to stop having babies and kill themselves. If you were just looking at it in terms of suffering is bad, joy is good, and you just map out the probabilities of suffering and pain happening versus the probabilities of joy and love and meaning arising from momentary experience happening, you're way more likely to get the bad stuff, but yet we continue, yet we progress. Existence itself is inherently irrational and unjustifiable using logic and rationality and reason, whereas maybe not reason, depending on the definition of reason, but what Ian McGilchrist speaks to more importantly than, than I think anyone I've come across at the moment is this recognition of different forms of knowledge and different and the height the, and the harm that the hyper focus we're doing that takes the natural world and just pictures it as this as the harm like to use like Francis Bacon language like we're going to harness nature and put a harness on it and control it and it's like this a series of resource just a collection of resources for us to extract from rather than this entity that we come from and we're part of and we return to that's this entirely interconnected, interdependent, interrelated being in and of itself of which we are just an expression of while we're around. Mm. It's a totally different, mm. it's a different mm. way of looking at reality. And I just think that myth, myth, but mythology speaks to that story. Like mythology kind of helps us to navigate the irrational in a way that it's, it's, it a, it's a way, to, a form of truth that's just as maybe even more important to life than the rational, logical forms of truth that we can get that allows our GPS to work and allows our satellites to adjust their clocks, to adjust for the fact that time moves differently in space because of fucking general relativity or whatever. So, sorry, I went in a bit of a rant well, there, but I you kind of spoke uh, fucking no, no. harder. It's perfect. But like, nothing, if you think just as you're finishing talking about myth, like nothing, nothing can be more true than myth. You know, we think of it in the opposite way, but if you think of even, even in the modern context, in the context of rational materialism and modernity and so on, um, these are the myths that we tell ourselves, you know, the myth of endless progress or whatever. These yeah. sorts of ideas are essentially mythic, irrational ideas that we, but nothing can be more true than the myths upon which we kind of um, uh, ground our being or whatever. At the same time, I suppose, there's a great kind of falsehood that, that is present in a lot of, um, in a lot of what, you, again, exactly what you described there. Like there's one of the, one of the things, like one of the things I'm, one of the things I'm struck by, even in the context of kind of rational materialism, you take Descartes, who's the kind of, say, the father of rational materialism, and he was shown a vision of uh, what was an angel came to him and said um, something about the reading of nature is measure and number. Or yeah. Is something with this reference to basically, if you want to under, the, the understanding of nature is measure and number. And bam, you know, with that, rational materialism is, is created. But it was a fucking angel who came and, and told him this. Yeah. Like, this is this yeah. is how he, he got this 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 thought it was kind of imparted to him or whatever. And so we we've kind of relegated all these other the the, the kind of metaphysical spaces have been kind of uh, like you said, this God-shaped hole. And that's something that we're we're stumbling through the early phases of now in this country of trying to work out uh, and in the West more broadly, I think, trying to work out well yeah, what yeah. what replaces God, when with this when when when, yeah. when with this kind of collapse occurs, is it shopping and football and Twitter and what is it like? What are we doing? Where are we going? And why are we doing it? COVID um, wars replaces that. Yeah, well, yeah, exactly. The, the, the latest <laughs> culture war. What are we even arguing about? Like we can't agree on any of the basic, basic terms. But one at this point, I think to one of the, uh, they're reading a fantastic book at the minute by Father Eugene Seraphim Rose, an Orthodox monk and priest called Nihilism, which I would suggest that that people look at and read as well, where he kind of tries to, <coughs> excuse me, tries to come to grips or analyze the root of kind of modern revolution in, in, in the West, basically, and the, the collapse of what he sees as the, the, the slide into nihilism as a result of the, the collapse of the idea of truth and the, the rise of uh, the idea of truth being relative, basically. And so this idea yeah. nowadays that, uh, well, that truth is relative, which... Yeah, well, the, and, uh, but he, he, he makes a very insightful point in it when he points out the contradiction at the heart of the assertion that all truth is relative, which in yeah. itself is an absolute statement. You know? Yeah. And so at the heart of that, there is this, this error on which nihilism is, is uh, varying forms of kind of nihilist dialectic are, are built, basically. And, and so we're kind of stumbling through the different phases of that. Um, and so it's something that we do need to we need to navigate and work our way 
you know, we don't need new stories, but we need to reconnect with the old ones. And it's not even that we need to kind of, you know, live in straw huts and take our shoes off and stuff like this. It's, it's to, to, but it's to be embraced, I suppose, I don't know, to, to be able to embrace set principles or orient ourselves with a certain meaning in a way that isn't being done for many of us, I think, in, in, um, in contemporary society and modernity at the moment, you know, where, yeah. where when you start to see through some of the lies and hypocrisies of your own generation or age or whatever, then where do you go from there? Like, what, what, do, you, what do you replace it with? And so a lot, of, a lot of people, I think, are struggling with a sort of inherent nihilism in our lives, a sort of meaninglessness that, that uh, is quite all pervasive in so many ways and attacks in so many registers like rising damp. And so to go back to the idea of folk tradition and folklore and, and energy and so on, I think a lot, one of the benefits of this sort of material of coming to know it, of coming to know the struggles or, or joys of your forebears is in that it orients you and grounds you in a place, this mm -hmm. place, this town here, you know, this isn't just mm -hmm. some lameness shithole that I've kind of grown up in. Well, this town has its own history and it has its own, okay, it mightn't be a large scale in, internationally renowned place. It maybe it's a small town, but it can have a noble history with noble people. And I remember walking through Mullingar. My grandfather was, was from Mullingar and I walked through there and found this little shop years ago and uh, uh, there was, it, it said a uh, sweet shop and jewelers. And I was like, one of these amazing old Irish country shops, like in a random little place. And there was an old man in it. I went into him and I said, well, do you know where Austin Friar Street is? That was the street my grandfather grew up on. And he said, you're, this is, you're on Austin Friar Street. And I said, my grandfather's name. And he's like, I knew your grandfather well. He actually knew my great grandfather, it turned out. But he went out from behind the counter, walked me around the town, showed me my grandparents' old house and another house in different places that belonged to, to, to my mother, some of my mother's family. And as we were walking back, he stopped, kind of, we were at this waiting for the green man to go. And kind of to himself, half to himself, half to me, he said, this is a good town. These are good people. I'll never forget it as long as it, it still it makes me well up when I think of it. It's, it's, yeah, yeah. It just barreled me down. It's like, this is, this is a good town. These are good people. It's just a small town in the Midlands in Ireland. Again, it's a place that, I mean, in the context of the Midlands, so often so people scoff or think, well, you know, whatever. Again, there's a kind of disrespect shown for so much of our own, it our own produce, backgrounds. It whatever. produced me, Johnny, didn't it? That's where I'm from. Well, look. I'm from Adlone. I'm from Westmead. I'm from Adlone. My dad is actually buried in Mullingar. He's from Mullingar. Okay, yeah. So the, I we, love the Midlands. I love the Midlands. <laughs> but, uh, but so people, so again, th but there's this sense of like, you know, this is a good town. These are good people. Who are, who are the people in, in the, who, who lived here before me? What's their story? What, what, ideas do they have what beliefs do they have there's something really tender and fragile but something really really powerful in that as well it's like a little tiny candle and if you can get that flame and, and protect it mm -hmm. you can actually burn a lot of other stuff down with that very small flame and people are crying out for that sort of resonant meaning that is presented and projected in by the stories that an elderly woman will have or the practices she recalls of making a May altar in honor of Our Lady at a certain time of the year, or what you, what they used to do at Christmas, or stories around certain fair days and so on. And once you start to do that about your own local area, you see that you're not just this kind of amnesiac um, uh, tabula rasa, kind of blank slate with nothing to, no memories, nothing to offer, who's, who the market can then kind of sell you your ideas and your own identity and your past. You actually come from a people with a shared history. And if you accept the idea of a shared history, then it implies the idea of a shared destiny. So there's a kind of quo vadis idea that then comes up next. Where are we going? What are, what are we doing as, a, mm. as, as individuals in, in communities and local communities and then nationally and internationally? What, what are we doing? Where are we going? What do we value? What do we want to do? What's important? What's unimportant? Whatever. So when you begin to connect, or for me personally, when I begin to connect with traditions and traditional customs and so on, it starts to link into to all sorts of other avenues. It's like pouring water into a maze and it comes out in all other different aspects and areas of your life. But ultimately, it's about, it's about meaning. It's about self-respect. And like I said at the start, we, Ian, when you were asking about the collections, it's about love, I think, at the end of the day. Love for those who have gone before us and love for those who are here around us now. Like I often feel more, more responsibility to the kind of generations who have gone before, who <coughs> are no longer with us. And also, you know, generations who are as yet unborn, who are going to inherit the, 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 the penny candle that's been passed to us now. I feel like I'm, I'm holding this little thing. And for my life, I can't let it go out. 
And if I can, I'd like to burn the world down with it, but you cannot let it go out. And so I feel a sense of yeah, responsibility to those who are gone before us, those who are no longer with us, and then those who aren't yet with us. And so that's kind of, that's... I, I, shall, post I, that, I shall post that video, Johnny, because they're the words that you put in that beautiful video on YouTube that makes me want to oh, cry yeah, right yeah. now. And when I watched that, <laughs> my eyes are welling up and I'm going to well up again, even talking about it. Johnny has yeah, this savage. beautiful three or four minute <clears throat> clip, I think, on YouTube. Just, it's absolutely brilliant. I'll put, I won't, I won't even mm. say it. I'll just put that, I'll put, I'll put that clip in there because Cheers, it's, yeah. it's, especially if you're Irish, it's going to make <laughs> you extremely emotional with the pictures and the words in there. And it really, for me, in the last year with all this COVID bullshit, no matter where you are on it in terms of your politics or health or whatever, I, th I found a real sense in the last six to 12 months as I wanted to reconnect with who I was and who I am sort of in my midlife now, my mid forties. And so one of the things I did was look back to where I came from. And to me, it's actually helped me orientate me into the future because exactly what you said, Johnny, if I don't understand where I came from, where can I go? Who am I as a person? You know, what is yeah. it to be Irish? And more importantly, when you're not in Ireland, what's it mean to be Irish in another country? Because yeah. I'm, as the, the more time I spend out, the, the less Irish I feel I become, but the more time I spend out, the less I can enter, I can, the, the less I even integrate in another country. So I'm caught in this kind of purgatory mm. zone where I'm not really Irish because I don't get current references and so on. But what I can do and what I can access is the past technologies of the people from before the time I left in the early 2000s. So that's always accessible and nobody can take that from me. I might know who's, who's hosting the Late Late Show next Friday night. I might know the current TV show on RTE, but I do know about our culture and our past and our history and I can access that anytime. And for me, that's just like a big well I can go back to anytime and feel reconnected and re-energized from it because I think we have a we have an excellent like country in terms of the people that we are. And regardless of the adversity we've gone through as a nation, Karen alluded to it, you know, we've had like the Neolithic age, the, Kel the Celts come in, we had the Vikings come in, we had the English come in, you know, we've been fucking absolutely battered around for thousands of years. And then probably 90% <laughs> of us have fled the place and gone to America and places like in Australia. But we're still very much ambassadors of the country. No matter where we go, being Irish, people love you. Like people, it gets you a free pass. It gets you an in. It gets you, gets you away with a lot of shit you normally wouldn't get away with. Like I was here for 10 years and I got pulled over by the cops about crossing, doing a traffic infringement. I just acted stupid like an Irish man and got off. So there you go. Like it helps you in every part of, <laughs> every part of your life, I, you know? So you just get away with a lot of stuff too. But, but really it does, this kind of stuff helps you reconnect with yourself as a person, which links in with what Karen was saying about Ian McGilchrist stuff. And particularly from doing this podcast with Karen over the last eight to nine months, I felt this, you know, a kind of big swing in my life where years ago, I grown up as a Catholic, wanted to be a good Catholic, then went really atheist and then started coming back to kind of spirituality through Eastern philosophy with the connection with martial arts and so on. And now I'm, I wouldn't say I'm gone Christian, but I'm more open to uh, Christian ideology and other religions and taking more like the Bruce Lee approach, like what's useful to use it. But it's also helped me come around and reconnect with who I am. And I'm getting this more fuller, um, experience really of who I am and who came before me. So it's kind of it's kind of weird or hard to describe, but I just feel like I'm I've come like full circle back to a belief where I had belief and I lost belief and now I have belief. That's probably the where it's gone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's something that I can I can relate to as well. Isn't it strange as well that we need to kind of that their greater sense of individual fulfillment or or selfhood or something or or self becoming can be manifested once you return to a sort of communal tradition. You know, there's a kind of paradox in here in that. Yeah. Like, whereas again, in so many ways, modernity would suggest would 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 say to you, reject tradition at all levels, like, yeah. and would kind of worship the new, the novel, uh, just by virtue of its newness, is is somehow um, uh, kind of I don't know, given favor for some reason because it's it's it is new. It's like, what, what's you know <laughs> what it's shit. <laughs> Why? Why is the new thing necessarily something that's a benefit? And so, so many, so many of the the structures, I suppose, that are put in place today, are are they tend towards a kind of hyper individualism, and yet they they there is no person present at the center. You know what I mean? Of that yeah, 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 individualism, yeah. whatever. Yeah, these are just. There's a brilliant line from. There's a brilliant yeah, line from exactly, the yeah. little book. 
is a little book called uh, Finite and Infinite Games by James Cars. He's a theologian in um, some university in America, but he has a line, and it's a, it's a paraphrase that he said something like, a man cannot be a self by himself. Mm. Is the line, and it reminded me of it there when you were describing that, that we, we, we are who we are in relation to other people. Exactly. And, yeah, so if, if you think of the idea of rites of passage in the life cycle mm. as well, like, this is a perfect uh, instance here where, where that's where this is, is shown. Like it's, you know, rites, uh, rituals are essentially transformative. <clears throat> you enter into a ritual in one state and then you are transformed and you're, you're, so think of betrothal to marriage or something like that, right? And then, you know, the couple who kind of go, who are betrothed and then they enter as two single people and they're married. And now in the eyes of the community, their role is transformed and they're recognized then as in this other form, basically. So their, their selfhood has changed, not because they stood in the steps of the church and declared it themselves there and then, but because there's a communal recognition of this, that someone has undergone this transformative kind of ritual uh, state, or whatever. And so again, it's, it's like you said, it's, we need, um, I suppose, a communal recognition in that sense to, for ourselves. It goes back to, to like Dahi's idea of the, the, the the wisdom of the many expressed by the wit of the few and the idea of the individual finding expression in the communal as opposed to finding expression in the hyper individualized which might do for a while but it's utterly eventually becomes totally meaningless and, and nihilistic yeah. i think hollow yeah i think hollow yeah yeah, yeah ultimately yeah, yeah. I did, think... go ahead Karen. no it was, it was just about to, to... no just i think that uh, <laughs> well, everybody's talking at the same time I love it alright Gary yeah, go get, Johnny go yeah, there's a kind of breaking up as well <laughs> Johnny go ahead oh, I can't, just, just that the, these are the things that we're these are the things that we're struggling with at the minute I think in many ways or things certainly that I that I definitely yeah. have for years now just been kind of obsessed the question of modernity and of meaning belonging and identity and, and essentially religious thinking forms of religious mm -hmm. thinking and how to revivify and re kind of inculcate those in you know my life and then in communal life more broadly i don't have the answer <laughs> to any of those questions really as of yet I'm kind of stumbling through drawing a chalk outline of the body for for, for years it feels <laughs> like but uh um but yeah these are things that, that i think we can all relate to this kind of nagging void feeling and uh so these are the things with which we struggle at the minute but again that's why i think tradition is so important that a knowledge of folk tradition is a starting point not necessarily as a solve all as the answer to all of the ills we're describing but as a starting point as a root a base you know solid base from which to, to a foundation on which to build yourself um uh, i think it's it's you can't go wrong if you start with with uh, that sort of those sort of traditional structures to work out first and foremost who are you where do you come from what what is your story and um, yeah, you're not. We're not as ruthless as we as we're made to feel, as we're made to believe, mm. or disconnected. Yeah, it's a method of control. I think to, 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 you know, yeah. people are. You can you can easily sell shit to people when they don't have any idea about who they are or what they are, and and a lot of barriers to commerce are essentially kind of traditional ideas as well and, and structures and so on. So um, people are more malleable and easy to control. I think when they're hyper individuated, when we're kind of alone in our pods yeah do you, do you ever read anything by um are you familiar with paul king's north yeah yeah he's yeah a, absolutely deadly yeah. yeah savage altogether yeah, yeah really he's really good love his yeah love his his writings and and um essays and so on and chatting to him recently enough and hope to to do an interview with him for the podcast as well pretty soon so um Excellent. i want to read some more of his not just his essays but his books i've ordered savage gods there while it's taken bloody ages to come out to me but um yeah, really, really like his writings and speaking, I must say, yeah. And because his framing of the kind of modernity was specifically using the language of the machine, yeah, I think is yeah, really, yeah. and he's using that from a previous writer whose name I can't remember, but uh, but his description of it's it's like the kind of essence of it is the basically like the incentive structures in modernity and the the games we need to play based on the inst the things we're told are valuable and yeah. then it feeds itself and then it ends up basically self-perpetuating and self-expanding that result in like, and you can think of obviously examples in terms of like what you described earlier on around disconnection from place where 
capitalism requires not only the movement of capital. So you just, you go to wherever the, the cheapest the labor is, for are. example, because you're <clears throat> legally obligated to have, to maximize returns for shareholder investments. So that means if you can go to Poland with your factories and you have to, and this kind of stuff, mm. or another equivalent would also be, even if you do that, it also, the other side of it is, and it, it requires the movement of people. Because then people, the workers are going to need to be gotten from somewhere, which means you're uprooting people, yeah, people and taking them to place and bringing them to urban centers where they're living vertically in apartment blocks or whatever that are totally disconnected from where they grew up and totally disconnected from where they are. And then work necessitates this movement. So you're hopping around and then you're losing your roots. Literally, you've torn up your roots and then you don't get a, you're, you're maybe not settling in places because your job might require to move. And then it's the... The, the, the big shadow side of of this whole uh, of modernity, particularly in the kind of the the, the secular world, the secular world is is this disconnection, and then it's the shadow side of individuality, where like it's it's the individual at the expense of any acknowledgement of interrelation, interconnection, interdependency, which which doesn't leads, even which stand leads in, to a kind of it leads to this faceless homogeneity as well, where the only the only yeah. common denominator at the end of the day is money. And so, again, you know, try that as, as a solution for any sort of community. Yeah. And see how that but, goes. But Johnny, this is rife across the world. Like, I, I've seen this. I had the great privilege of traveling my last job all over the world and getting paid to do it and being mm. looked after. And I went to places like Kazakhstan and South Africa and America, Canada. Everywhere looks the same now. Everywhere's mm. got the same shite rolled out. Subway, McDonald's, Starbucks, blah, blah, blah. Classic example in my lifetime, I went to Prague in the early 90s, in my late teens, and just opened up in communism. Oh, like, no brand names, cheap as chips. Went back in 2010. It was still cheap, but it was like three, four times more than what it was when I was there. But it was Subway, McDonald's, Starbucks. It's like, ah, oh, this place is fucked, like, everywhere. Like, it's just interesting what you talk about, that homogeneity. It's just, it's everywhere. Everybody's the same. And now I'm starting to see even people in certain age brackets and suburbs. There's the 40-year-old man in Lycra that likes to cycle and he's doing his MBA and he's having a coffee mm. and he's got two kids and he drives an SUV. And everybody's just fucking bland and the same. And that's why I think then if you're different or what Karen's talking about, like I think people like us on this on this, <laughs> this conversation, we probably don't fit nicely into those groups like Lego blocks. We're like thorns really trying to get shoved into the hole. Because we have, we can hold opposing views at the one time, or we can have, we can hold conflict and be and be okay with it and say, "Well, oh, don't really know it. This is true and that's true," and because mm. we're comfortable knowing who we are and where we come from. Not that we have all the answers, but we're comfortable where we are at the moment. And I think to what mm. Karen is saying and what you're saying about this, how modernity is driving this, it drives a lot of fear underneath it as well. But if you're comfortable in knowing who you are, where did you come from, where are you going, and who's coming with me. Mm -hmm. not too many people and it can knock you yeah, out well, it, no it's it's a different it's a different dynamic entirely and then it's important to bear in mind that people are kind of yeah victimized by the machine as it as it kind mm -hmm. of rolls forth and steamrolls entire communities and flattens people um but it's uh yeah i mean i think yeah I, i'm inclined to agree i must say as i say but uh i'm not quite sure like what the immediate kind of the, the solution to these things necessarily is but there, there's there's a couple of thinkers like you were mentioned there this being the same all over the world the same as Eddie Lennon calls it the same bland shite he's right he's dead right Eddie Lennon is, is dead right I agree with him the whole world has become American westernized and it's just the same shite everywhere you go and in, in many same. ways yeah but there are different thinkers like there's a school of traditionalist perennialist kind of thinkers people like Rene Guénon who was writing amazing prescient stuff writing in the, in the 30s and so on about the same things that we're discussing now. He wrote some amazing books, The Crisis of the Modern World, and um, one I'm reading in a minute, The Reign of Quantity and the Sign of the Times, Signs of the Times, where he's talking about basically reign a sort of, of quantity. Kind of like a the reign of quantity. Yeah, I'll send you a link to it. Mm. Rene Guin on the reign of quantity. But uh, the idea that there's a kind of cosmic degeneration taking place <clears throat> and that they're in certain religious kind of ideas of these cycles of ages. So in the Hindu tradition, you have these different kind of ages from a golden age downward to the, to the one, the most degenerate one. Yeah, exactly. This whole kind of idea of the Kali Yuga. And then 
Hesiod in the Greek would talk about the Iron Age, the Wolf Age, whatever. And then I suppose in Christian tradition, you have the whole idea of the fall, you know, the fall from, from grace or whatever. And right, so Car- Car- there's Car- a constant like the idea age of, of Ion. A- a- age of Iron. I- Ion, Carl Jung. As, yeah. as Carl Jung has oh, no. talked about like this, Ion. A-I-O-N. What, what's that? What did he... <coughs> I put some link in today. The, the Uber yeah, okay, Boy. Yeah. There's a great podcast in Ireland too. Uh, Uber Boy, is it? Karen, who yeah. boy, guys, they got nine, I think, nine episodes on Ion for to discuss this. Uh, only young lads, only in their like mid 20s, and they're oh, absolutely fantastic. These lads oh, nice. uh, break down Ion for Carl Young, um, which is a book about going through these different ages and where we're going, which ties in with like oh, okay, Yuga. Yeah. It ties in also with spiral dynamics. If anybody's or if you're aware of spiral dynamics by Professor Claire Graves, we're going through these levels of advancing consciousness. Like so, there's all mm-hmm. these kind of similarities again. Like there are, yeah, there are different. Yeah, yeah, and then even you know, Terence McKenna would have, he had his like his theory yeah. of novelty that we're kind of racing towards what do you call the eschaton, the object at the the transcendental object at the end of time. In his these lectures of his, but he's talking about this kind of uh, in, increasing novelty, increasing complexity all the time, all the time, all the time. So. What I'm saying, I suppose, is as, as opposed to looking at like entirely local or national or historical or economic forces, whatever, that there are other thinkers as well who posit sorts of um, kind of cosmic tides or currents in a way, if cosmic is the right way to put it. These grander kind of ages that, that at times uh, just have a natural ebb and flow, like a seasonal kind of death and periods of rebirth and growth and so on to them. And that according to some of these kind of thinkers, at least we seem to be to be caught in the in the the downward current uh, of a certain type yeah. of age that characterized by certain types of expressions you know you see that in tradition as well funny examples of like um pr- comparison with previous generations where like um there were certain prophecies made i think it was a column killer had a prophecy about every generation getting smaller and having a tendency to lie more and people being kind of less healthy and weaker and this, that, and the other. There's a description in the Handbook of Irish Folklore written by Sean O'Sullivan, the same guy who wrote Irish Wake Amusements. There's this funny kind of bit on, on successive generations comparing each other to one another. So again, is that is that something we're thinking of or is it even a useful structure as, as a way to think of, of, of what it is that we're going through? I find it some at times to be, to be uh, yeah, useful in that regard to kind of, to consider that there are broader tides at work that we're kind of we're, we're moving through the phases of and so how we how we i don't know how we deal with that is in many ways i suppose a question of of courage i suppose yeah there's there's a something that i think is a a core issue related to and it, it ties into a lot of what we've discussed i think is uh, and this it, it'd be interesting to hear what you think about this is is basically our inability to hold the rational and the irrational and recognize the place for both. And by irrational, I mean, you know, like basically where, where mythology fits in and, and religiosity and non-transferable experiential knowledge and that that has a place as well as, and that, ha- but, it, but we also, we can't throw the baby out with the bat water and we need to still, and it's still useful to be able to make technology and to be able to do science and to be able to make innovations, etc. But that, we can't put one thing as as soon as you put one thing as the primary main thing that everything else must bow to you just things quickly degenerate then because that becomes like a dogma whereas when you have kind of contraries that that have function as generating friction you can end up in a sweet spot Mm. so like ian mcgillchrist would talk about um the pre like he he basically has this view of philosophy taking a downward turn basically by Plato that Socrates was kind of like the the beginning of the end for really useful philosophy and that the pre-Socratics particularly a fellow called Heraclitus was like the the main as the the main people to anchor off because everything flows Mm. and this kind of notion there was this act like you mentioned there this bigger patterns like really fascinating historical examples would be like the axial age like that period of three four hundred years somewhere in the middle of, you know, the first century BC, where there was this period where like Judaism formed, uh, Taoism, Buddhism, Hinduism, all came around in separate places in the world, all separately and instantiated these core, (laughs) what are now still around, and even other religions as well that are still around, but to much smaller degrees, like Zoroastrianism, et cetera, and these other ones that came around this period of three or 400 years that has been referred to as the Axial Age. 
that then went on to to, mm-hmm. to feed a whole lot of other things. And and Heraclitus would have had would have had phrases like um, uh, "war is the father and king of all things." And but that wasn't necessarily actual war. It was referring to tension and friction between. Uh, um, contradicting ideas that is actually functions you it it, it 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 has a generator function to it that the friction does yeah. and that our, yeah, yeah. so much of our problems is it, it it seems is our inability and like you mentioned there like terence mckenna and I, a question i actually planned to ask was about psychedelics because and and mythology and psychedelics and because i can't help but see like i've had some exper- interesting experiences myself with dmt and i can't help but think that that there's, there's there's influences, especially from various forms of mushrooms, etc. That I was going to ask you actually about was there any any thoughts on that? But it, just as that maybe psychedelics in our modern culture, like looking at some of the research, the really cool research, which is like this marriage of worlds coming from really prestigious medical schools like Johns Hopkins University, Imperial College London, and these play and and dozens and dozens of other universities all over the world and medical schools doing really serious scientific research mm. and fi- basically on psychedelics and addiction death anxiety terminally ill patients and finding absurd results in a positive way about the impact and i there's a, we had chris led to be on the podcast here who wrote this book for oxford university press which is an interesting sign of the times itself when oxford university press published a book called the philosophy of psychedelics in their psychiatry <clears throat> publication. So that's how mainstream the utterly irrational, the, like it's hard to think yeah, of yeah. more irrational states or ways of thinking than when you're after taking five, six grams of psilocybin and and see what happens, you know? Mm-hmm. So, but the fact that that's, these worlds are marrying, that it's like, that potentially, <laughs> that like this could function as a, that this, this to itself, it's something we didn't get a chance to talk about with Chris because we ended up having an episode that focused on kind of defining terms and getting a lay of the land and hopefully we'll have him on again. But um, I suppose I, I suppose as a, as a question, I suppose I'm after firing a lot of information at you basically, but <laughs> firstly on that, the tension between rational and the irrational and what you thought of that. And then secondly, I suppose as in relation to the, the psychedelics is that a question that I had planned was, was is there any thought or thoughts or research or, or speculation even on the role that altered states, whether it be from psychedelics, like mush, local mushrooms or other psychedelic substances that are in the environment, or like things like other ways of getting there, like trance, dancing, you know, f- fasting, etc. So, is there any what role that? So there's two questions there. Yeah, and, yeah. and this will be the last question, Johnny. We'll let you go after this. So I'm, I don't want cool, you to cool. pass out in the car. <laughs> <laughs> no, no panic. So, just a couple of things really fascinating what you're saying there i think historically we in ireland or irish people are, have been very good at holding though that dynamic tension in place in our minds i think it's one of the essential characteristics of what we do and who we are in many ways lots of the art that we've created from the early literature lots of the kind of the artistic um the creativity or whatever that we that we embody which is one of the characteristics i think of of the Irish as well as our artistic output, you know, especially especially as far as use of words and creativity and music and so on. No one could, could, could deny that. I think essentially something that is really, we're very good at is holding those two contradictory kind of things in place together. Maybe less so in more recent years. Again, you talked about, you know, having a pre-modern and a post-modern state. And so now we're kind of pandering in basket cases to a greater or lesser degree, not, not overall, but, um, so I think maybe that's kind of slid away a little bit, but overall, I think we're very we're very adept at marrying those kind of contradictions and paradoxes and living in them, and that's expressed ultimately by you know, ideas around the other world. That kind of it's always just around the corner. It bleeds into our world all the time. There's these kind of flashes of the fantastic into the world of the mundane or whatever. So that's something that's part and parcel. That's at the core of of Irishness in a way. I think that that ability to look at and to hold the absurd or to hold the divine or something like that in place in, in while also in you know the normal world um then to your second question about psychedelics that's an, an, an area of particular interest to me as well personal interest i did an episode on that on mushrooms in tradition because i uh i've was really i've just been fascinated by the idea of of approaches to psychedelics in irish tradition and 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 kind of culture but it also seen a lot online of very speculative kind of references <clears throat> to, you know, 
veiled kind of hidden mushroom cults and so on and so forth, which when you actually look at the sources, there seems to be basically no evidence for, despite Mayo, I mean, I would love if there were kind of uh, Irish mushroom cults going back through the time, but they're just, there is no evidence for them there. So um, if you look at, say, old record re records from, <laughs> um, say, Roman military observers, old or, or like British topographers in the medieval period, or you look at law, early Irish law or legal and court records or newspaper accounts from the 1700s on, there are no references to a cult, a culture of, of mushroom use in Irish tradition. Um, it, and they're just, it's just not there, basically. And so not only is there in the formal records, there's nothing. We also have in the Folklore Commission, there was a very interesting ethnography, a kind of fieldwork study done um, by the folklore collectors around mushrooms in, in Irish folk tradition. And it was done at the request of Orr Gordon Watson, who's the father of ethnomycology, yeah. who in 1956 had this kind of uh, this experience with with Maria Sabina, where he went and they, they kind of uh, met her and had these these kind of um, shamanic uh, rituals with her and the kind of mushrooms of power, basically. And, and so uh, Orr Gordon Watson and his wife, Tina, were writing this book, um, Mushrooms, Russia and History, or I might have the title wrong, like an absolutely incredible, fantastic, fantastic tome. Like it costs, I found a copy online for, I think it was five grand or something like that. So it's going to have to wait in the, on the on the on the wish list. Yeah, there's only a couple of hundred copies printed. And absolutely, you can get PDFs of it. It's just a, a fantastic book. They basically realised one day uh, uh, during uh, their honeymoon honeymoon, they were walking through the Catskills somewhere in the states, and Tina, who was a Russian, she ran off away from her husband's side, and she kind of knelt down at this patch of mushrooms and started kind of calling them all these affectionate names and kind of worshiping them or whatever she was like she's so delighted to see them so happy to see them and started picking them and he was horrified and he was like what are you doing picking these poisonous toadstools like you'll kill us what, what's the matter and she was she laughed at him and he was horrified by her um she brought them home insisted on putting them in the soup <coughs> drying some of them out and so on and he was like i'm going to wake up uh, dead tomorrow basically <laughs> but it, what it, it basically revealed is huge cultural kind of cleavage between the two of them her as a Russian with this great love of mushrooms and knowledge of all the kind of names of them, and him as a kind of Anglo-Saxon American with this just abhorrence for them, and that then set them thinking: What is this? What's going on with this kind of among the Indo-European people, yeah, yeah. Indo-European peoples and their approach to mushrooms? So this fantastic description, looking at art, folk tradition, folk tales, proverbs, all sorts of stuff. Or Gordon Rawson basically got in touch with the department, the Irish Folklore Commission, in nineteen. The first correspondence I could find in the archives, I couldn't believe I found these letters from him to, to Delargy and the others in the commission in 1961, I think. And basically he's making inquiries as to the state of the tradition in Ireland. And so I couldn't believe I was holding this letter from Moore Gordon Watson, that, you know, the letter that, yeah, yeah. the hand that wrote the letter that, that took the mushrooms even from Maria Sabina. It's like, here's this thing. It was like a kind of religious artifact almost. You know? yeah. And so I got onto the, to the archives in, in Harvard a very helpful archivist there. She filled me in on some of the blanks and sent me some of the correspondence that I didn't have in the Folklore Commission. Um, so Or Gordon Watson wanted to know what was the state of the tradition in Ireland. Delargy sent his collectors in the case. And so we have this small manuscript questionnaire kind of based on, on this topic. And what it reveals is that a lot of the time, like in much of the Northern Hemisphere or among the Celtic peoples and Nordic peoples, there's a kind of um, a mycophobia, a generalized fear of mushrooms, a distaste for them. And that's something that Watson suggested may have been a result as a kind of a religious taboo that goes so far back, whereas they were venerated in some places, but only a priestly class could use them. And so yeah. a kind of taboo against popular use came into tradition, tradition with the result then that people were kind of had an abhorrence and a fear of them. But either way, they're generally not not they're barely even eaten, really. They were, so I have some accounts uh, in the podcast. I found as much as I could, different songs or accounts of people selling them and going through the just different manuscripts accounts to see what is the state of the tradition. <coughs> but obviously, um, you know, so well, basically my, the, 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 my hypothesis theory, I don't know, is that the contemporary use of magic mushrooms in Ireland of picking liberty caps and so on, is something that only goes back to the 1970s, I would say. British Mycological Society wrote a paper in 1968 where they identified psilocybin in psilocybin semilanchiata, liberty cap, 
And so I think around that time with the hippie movement in England and so on, and then over to Ireland, people began to, to then identify these mushrooms, pick them and consume them as a kind of countercultural thing. But that's all I would say because of Maria Sabina introducing them to Or Gordon Wasson, who introduced them to the world, quote unquote, to the West at large. And then that information spreading across America, then over to the UK and then the UK to Ireland. And that there isn't this long standing cult of their use. There may have been individual accounts or uses of them, but there's no, there's just not really much evidence for it at all. Um, but again, that's an aside, that's a kind of culturally specific answer to that question, I guess. As an aside, I would agree. I think there's a huge amount of, of, um, of really useful and beneficial research that's going on there at the minute. And that, that stands again to open the doorway into the human consciousness in a way that is, would be very useful, I think, and pertinent in dealing with, like you're saying, trauma or end of life, anxiety and stuff like this. Mm. Uh, and in working with nature, working with plants, and then I suppose trying to re-remove some maybe stereotypical views uh, associated with psychedel psychedelics and the excesses yeah. of the 60s or whatever and so on. So there's a lot of interesting stuff there. But then in a broader sense, there's, you know, the strange, the Irish are no strangers to intoxication. So, um, or, and even <laughs> the sense of like, uh, uh, even of ways to, to, to kind of like, say you mentioned fasting and, and stuff like this, or like, um, I mean, decading, the Irish word for Wednesday is based on, on, on means first fast and dehina means Friday, just day of fasting. So that's a kind of early re reference to early Christian practice that we still, the names of the days of the week are kind of named after. So fasting was part and parcel of Irish tradition. So was things like uh, sweat houses or sweat lodges around the country in different places. Mm. Like, in as well. like in America, America with Indian people. So they're sometimes used as kind of cure, like medical interventions. Yeah, but we have really? them. We have different. Kevin Danner who did a lot of research on that. There's still ruins of them all around. Yeah, really? bars be lit and you'd, I'd you'd never heard of Yeah, 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 yeah. Sweat lodges, sweat houses. Yeah, small little buildings, and you'd kind of cram into them. And and um, and now again, it wasn't. I think it was more in a, in a medical context that that was done than this kind of I don't know transcendental or meditative one. Yeah, but yeah, sure, it wasn't like an altered sure the, the two were never. Not necessarily, but then again, even in the context of altered states, like one of the things that used to be done by the poets in early Ireland was that they would compose their poetry in total darkness. That was a kind of prerequisite that you'd really? you'd, um, you'd retreat into this this pitch black state and lie down and, and you try to compose these. And again, the early Irish poetry, it's not free verse kind of um, stuff. It was all very, very complicated syllabic kind of metrical systems where, you know, the first line has to have seven syllables. The second line has to have eight syllables and some has to be, there has to be some kernel rhyme and clashing of, there's really, really complicated structures. And then you'd have these amazing poems that are kind of 40 stanzas long praising nature or, or, or whatever. Um, so they would create these very kind of complex poetical structures, but they would do it in a, in a somewhat extreme state, I suppose, with reference to kind of this pitch blackness. But well, um, that that also just reminds me of that cave in Roscommon, Owen the Goat. Is it Owen the Goat? Oh, in Owen the Goat, yeah, the cave yeah, in the cuts, where, yeah. where the people go in, yeah. go in there, are kind of warriors to go in there and spend some time in there in complete darkness. It's this kind of nearly coming back to what you said on, write a passage, and then they will come out of there. And if you kind of survive that, then you were like, mm. you know, a man or a warrior or whatever. So it's interesting how the darkness or this seclusion or isolation can be used to to go beyond, to connect with something, or as a rite of passage as well, or to use Carl Lung's language, is yeah. you integrate the shadow in that in that process as well, you know? That there's, there's all these things at play here. Yeah, and I'm just thinking as well, even in the, and even in the context of what you're saying, you're a bit, bit uh, energy and so on, and, you know, if you think of the dark as just boundless, formless possibility, do you know what I mean? A sort of, not quite chaos or something, but just, um, well, Avoid. chaos in the sense of, you know, a kind of boundless void out of which yeah. it's a kind of pregnant void out of which all these different possibilities and, and structures of being can can come. But to do that, you need to go into the dark <clears throat> for it's those things to, a, to, to rise up or whatever. So there's, there's a lot a of podcast. fruitful, um, yeah, there's a lot of fruitful kind of thought. Well, there's a podcast there, that, there, that might be of both of you. There's a, there's a particular episode of Aubrey and Marcus podcast that might be of interest to both of you because it would cross both of year worlds maybe is that it, it's a it's a podcast that came out a year or two ago where he was describing doing a darkness retreat in germany in the black forest that involved seven days in a in total darkness in a room in a particular retreat that does this where there's like multiple multiple little doors that lead out for he was in a room 
that even when he wanted to open the window to get fresh air, there'd be a visor outside and the air and, a, and the insides of this kind of, an almost kind of like a chimney kind of thing on the other side of the window that allowed fresh air to come in would be painted black so light couldn't reflect off it. And you'd basically spend seven days in absolute darkness. But then the way he described it, because he wore one of these rings for tracking how much he actually slept and he could look back at it the following week or two afterwards and look back at what actually happened during that week. But he was his his circadian rhythm totally went out of whack because he had Just no quite, yeah. his superchiasmatic nuclei had no blue light to work with to, to regulate sleep cycles. So as a result, he he his started having he'd be conscious and then would start be in a dream state while conscious because his the, his dream world and waking world started mel becoming the same and going in and out of each other and passing through each other because there was nothing to regulate when his brain should be asleep and when it shouldn't be. And he, his descriptions then and what he saw, what he encountered were just like, he, he broke down in tears multiple times during the podcast around these visions and these. I'd say it is. Kind of, <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely class. That's, like, that, in, that, that's, that's the kind of world I play. And obviously, as you know, Karen has been a chronobiologist. Yeah. And so in chronobiology, that SCN, the superchasmatic nucleus, which is the size of your small cluster cells half the size of your small fingernail the guy who discovered that was on my podcast uh professor mm. russell foster from oxford and coincidentally actually was my phd examiner a number of years ago and so russell found that cluster of cells which actually as karen said takes light in from the eye and regulates so when people say like we can live on top of nature or harness nature no you fucking can't because that simple mm. act of sleep and wake cycles you're so intrinsically linked to that location and that's what causes jet lag it's a disruption of that and so some of the early studies in sleep and wake were actually putting people into an underground mine with no watch and measure, got them to write down when they slept and when they woke up. And that's what you call, Karen, free running sleep schedules. And that's when people are just basically, they'll start shifting like an hour a day, an hour a day. So he could have been sleeping from, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning until 6 p.m. for all he knew. And he could have been gradually just, what you do is you start going around the clock, right? You start moving around and you have no control over it. And that's classic where it links back into, you know, how we are designed as diurnal animals linked to the light and dark cycles of the planet based upon the rotation, where we sit in the universe in relation to the sun and blah, blah, blah. And you start thinking about it and you go, hey, that's fucking really irrational, really. <laughs> like, and we're talking about the rationality of a sleep and wake cycle. So it doesn't surprise me he, he got completely out of whack. And I think this is another thing as well that we see in the literature um, around sleep and this is something i've been talking to johnny about is exploring this relationship with sleep mythology and 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 folklore and and there's lots of things around this in sleep states in scandinavia i did a short episode on recently on sleep for performance talking about this how these images occur how people have these kind of hallucinations or what they see or what happens and this happens in lots of sleep dep deprivation studies or sleep loss studies and i think many people for me being in the military especially in ireland out there in the middle of the night you know, you start fucking seeing stuff all over the place. You start, then you start thinking about stuff you thought about growing up, about the banshee and ring forts and fairies. And, you know, you're kind of falling you're on a patrol and then you stop on, on an exercise and then you, you might be kneeling down. You'll fall asleep kneeling down. Then someone will touch you. And like, like, was that a person or was it something? So you get into this kind of, you don't actually know where you are. And that's why sleep deprivation techniques are used in uh, interrogation. Because people get fucked up. They don't know what's going on. They don't know where they are, who's going on. And they just lose their mind. So mm. that would be a very dangerous retreat to do, actually. I'd rather do a month of silent retreat as opposed to seven days of darkness. So I'll have to listen mm. to that because that... that he said be, it was the most... Yeah, he, I listened to it hard. a couple of times. And, um, I, I listened to it a couple of times or watched it a couple of times. And he said... And he's had... He's, a, he's had countless experiences with... For NNDMT, 5-MeO-DMT, ayahuasca, huachuma, psilocybin mushroom, the whole gamut, ketamine, everything. And he said that this seven-day retreat was the most psychedelic experience he's ever had. This seven seven days in darkness. Total, it was the nothing came close. Nothing scares him more in terms of doing it again either. Crazy, from any man. of these. Yeah. So it's fascinating to hear that there was like, I didn't realize that there would have been, you know, that this cave tradition in Roscommon, that, that, that sounds... Yeah, but he was only for a few days, Johnny. Is that right? Only a few days to go in for us, two or three nights. I'm not sure. Now, I know, I know, I only got, I always heard about it as a kind of entrance to the mouth of hell kind of scenario, yes. and that, um, yeah. that different kind of demons and cats and stuff would come out of it at, at the sound at Halloween. But I hadn't heard that, but I know of the place. All right. I've never, I've never been into it myself. You can, you can squeeze into it. And it's again, it's just like 
you'd look at it in a field, you wouldn't think there's anything there. Mm. Squeeze down under the rock into the ground, the whole cavern opens up. Interestingly, I think Douglas Hyde, the first president of Ireland, oh, yeah, he, yeah. Uh, if you crawl, if you go down to the back of the cave, he carved his name into the wall there somewhere. Did he? Yeah. He's, uh, he's, yeah, yeah, yeah. He had, his name is carved in there somewhere. But, um, but, but yeah, I mean, the idea, I suppose, of the dark and going in as a source of creativity is a very, a very old one. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, there's a lot of, a lot of resonant kind of imagery there, or whatever. But yeah. fuck if I would do a seven day retreat in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you would have had a few lock ins and a few bars, a few pubs in your time where you were fucking in darkness yeah. for, for, for a That's, few days. Yeah. And you wouldn't That's have a given a kind of darkness. <laughs> what's, what's, yeah, what's yeah, the point? True. What's the yeah, point? Yeah, used yeah. to be used to be a, speaking of darkness on that, we'll, we'll finish in a second. There used to be a bar in Athlone called McGuire's, and it was up on Connock Street. P people who maybe from there might remember this. But it was like a lock-in place you would go to. You'd no electricity, I don't think, or else you didn't try the lights. Be in there at four o'clock in the morning, pitch dark, because you couldn't see anything. You had to fucking light a cigarette to go to go for a piss. It was unbelievable. <laughs> it, it, it was I was like an old house or something. People, there was a bath in the in the toilets, and it was just a weird fucking place. But, you Are sure this wasn't just an abandoned gaffy? And probably was, yeah. But they were serving drink <laughs> after after two a.m. So Not you, bad. you had to go and knock on the back door and get in. But yeah, people were piss, <laughs> pissing in the bath, pissing in the sink. Oh, it was crazy. It was just a, one of those mental places. And then I think around maybe the time I left or just after it burnt down. So maybe for a short <laughs> No surprise if you bought all those like, dark spots. Exactly. Like, exactly. So, it was one of those like, <laughs> you know, so that's, that's, that's me reconnecting with my tradition and my culture. That's, uh, nice. that, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That'll, that'll be folklore soon, that place. <laughs> <coughs> Johnny, before we go, um, if people want to follow your work and um, get in contact with you, maybe make a big donation to to your work, which would be awesome. <laughs> we need some Bill Gates character to come in and actually uh, <laughs> keep this stuff alive because it's absolutely maybe not Bill, work. But yeah, someone maybe not Bill, uh, <laughs> maybe Melinda. I don't know. Um, yeah. Jeff Bolton, Jeff Bezos, ex-wife. Maybe she fancy it. We'll put Perfect. a picture of you up there. And, um, <laughs> uh, so yeah, how can people contact you, follow your work, or find out more about what you guys do? Um, <clears throat> They can go to a couple of different places, I suppose. I run an Instagram for the National Folklore Collection. So if you just search National Folklore Collection on Instagram, you'll find that there. Post of every day or every other day from the collections, photographs and manuscripts, accounts about different traditions. So you'll find stuff there. Then we have a huge online platform, duchas.ie, D-U-C-H-A-S dot I-E. <clears throat> That's our main kind of platform for, for digitized collections, manuscript collections and so on. So any Irish listeners, anyone who's in Ireland or who grew up abroad or people that indeed who are, who are listening from, from other countries, but who have Irish relatives, you could, for example, you could type in the name of a town or village that people were from, and you can read accounts from that area written by school children in the 1930s, uh, all different aspects of life that are covered there. And loads of kind of, we've over 12,000 photographs on there you, as well. You can, so, see your, you can see your granny's report card. <laughs> essentially. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so Dukas is another place to go and then um, Bluringly Bailadish is the podcast if you go if you go to soundcloud.com forward slash folklore underscore podcast you'll find a link to the podcast there but it's on Spotify and stuff as well so and iTunes and wherever around so yeah do get in touch if anyone has any queries or wants to chat about it or has any different ideas or questions about different aspects of tradition just let me know don't hesitate I'm always happy to to chat away about these sorts of things. Excellent. I, I, absolute fascinating conver conversation here today, Johnny. I could sit here for hours and hours. This is this is brilliant. The next time I'm back in Ireland. Same, savage. No, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, the next yeah. time I'm back in Ireland, if it ever happens, maybe in the year 2057, um, <laughs> when we're allowed out, you know, because we've been bold, um, hopefully we can all sit down. Uh, yeah, 100%. Pot, I'd love that. Pots of tea and, and, and hang sandwiches and Scones, and we can we can we can tell lies till the, till, till, <laughs> yeah exactly till, 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 till the cows come home. Deadly. Great stuff, Karen. Any questions? I really appreciate that. I, I've I had fucking I had loads more questions. Yeah. That we 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 had the <laughs> rabbit holes I wasn't expecting. That was class. That was really enjoyable. I appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, uh, pleasure. Thanks for the invite. I appreciate it. Yeah, but um, again, in person, we shall have to do these things. Yeah, yeah. yeah. More to more to resolve. Yeah. If you ever happen to be in Cork, let me know, man. If you ever if you ever make Sam, a yeah, 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 we'll do. Savage, we'll do. No worries, and uh, I'm as glad as uh, it's. We, it should be noted as well that um, Johnny is just over, getting over COVID, and so is Karen um, as well, just before Christmas. So technically, they're dead and they've come back from the dead. So 
I'd just like to acknowledge your presence and thanks for coming back from the spirit, <laughs> from the spirit world. And it's good to I see you back. I've got to go back there now. Yeah. <laughs> you got to go yeah, back yeah. there now. <laughs> <laughs> so I hope, I, hope you, I hope you recover well. I know Johnny's still coughing away there a little bit from it, but um, it's great. All right, the young friend, the sixth sense. One of us is Bruce Willis. <laughs> one of us, yeah. Which one? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 in actual fact, I'd say you're all fucking living in my world. I'd say when I died, I get tapped on the shoulder. Did you like that? You were dead. You were dead there for eighty years. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> They're well, all a figment of your imagination. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, Johnny. We'll let you go, man. Thanks very much. Really appreciate Savage. it. Appreciate right. it. Thanks, Lon. Thank you very much. Hello, Mila Margot. Nice and see you later. Good buddy.